get the engine going. We are broadcasting live. Hey, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our meeting of August 24th, 2021. Uh, we are experiencing quite the intensive heat wave, but I'm rest assured that uh, it will all be helpful with the harvest. This meeting is being conducted by means of electronic participation as permitted by Section 238. 3.1 of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended and the Town of Mono Procedure Bylaw 2020-42. Unfortunately, at this time, Council Chambers is not open to the public. This meeting can be viewed live uh, through our Mono Civic uh, portal. And also residents can join using the following access to information that's been provided or by dialing in by long distance. I want to confirm that there is a quorum of, of council members and I call the meeting to order. Public notification uh, to remind all uh, participating that this proceedings are being video recorded and broadcast. I remind council members that disclosure of pecuniary interest can be made now or at any time throughout the meeting. It must be done verbally and also in writing to the clerk. I'd like to ask Councillor Maitlo to read the Indigenous Land Acknowledgement. Thank you, Your Honour. We would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that the town of Mono resides within the traditional territory and ancestral lands of the Tionati, uh, Atawandaran, uh, Haudasani, and Ashinaabe peoples. We also acknowledge that the town of Mono resides within the treaty lands named under Treaty 18, the Nottawasaga Purchase of 1818. These traditional territories upon which we live and learn are steeped in rich indigenous history and traditions. It is with this statement that we declare to honor and respect the past and present and present connection to indigenous peoples with this land, its waterways and its resources. Thank you, Councillor Manklow. Uh, the first item is the approval of the agenda. We have a motion that Council approves the agenda of session 17-2021 as circulated. Could I have a mover? Moved by Nix and seconded by, second by Creelman. Is there any additions, deletions? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Is anyone opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Uh, approval of the previous minutes from session 15-2021 and 16-2021 as circulated. Could I have a mover? Moved by Martin, seconded by Mantelo. And is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Is anyone opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. There are no proclamations at this time. Public question period. Uh, Mr. Simpson, were there any questions submitted? We have two questions, Your Worship, that were submitted uh, in advance, but I see we also have one caller on the line who may, uh, may be here to ask counsel a question. Okay. The person that's on the phone. Person that's on the phone, would you like to uh, pose a question to counsel? No, not at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Simpson, if you'd like to read us out the uh, questions. So, the first question comes from uh, Mr. Justin Dakote, and he asked, uh, with respect to the parking bylaw, section 3.0 be removed or updated uh, such that it excludes residential roads that have lighting or are wide enough to safely permit summerside roadside parking and i'd like to add uh, that 3.0 of the parking bylaw is the section that states parking is not permitted on a highway for a period longer of time than three hours between midnight and 7 a.m okay Okay. 
I understand that uh, Justin's on the, the line and is trying to get audio and he's having difficulties. Um, so while we wait for him to try to resolve his technical problems, uh, <clears throat> any member of council want to make comment about overnight parking on residential roads? Yes, Fred? I mean, this, this is the first instance I've even thought of that section. Could could we, um, I mean, I don't mind the question today, but I, I'd like to confer with our Director of Public Works about, you know, why we had that in there originally and whether it, whether it is a good idea or whether we need it for safety reasons or security reasons. I, I just, could we think about that question for a meeting or two? Mike, do you have any comment? <clears throat> I could. I could comment on it now if, if council would like. Go ahead. So roads, the roads in the, the area of uh, our urban core, some of them are rural roadside cross section. It's not really set up for roadside parking. Um, it's uh, in the winter is definitely uh, when we when we really need uh, the roadside parking to be absent. Um, but the driveways and the, the front yard setbacks on these houses in our urban core are generally set back enough to hold uh, four to six vehicles. And, uh, and in our personal opinion, there's, there's no reason for cars to be parked on the road other than if there's an event or, a, uh, or a, an attraction in that area. Um, and that would be short term parking, but overnight parking should be uh, um, taken on by the individual's driveway and accompanied the same. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have Justin has logged into the meeting. Justin, are you able to get audio now? So, okay, so go, go ahead if you want, have further comments. All right, can you guys hear me through? Yeah. All right, perfect. So I, I just feel like this one clause in particular doesn't serve the purpose of safety, uh, residential appeal, or utility. Um, my concern is that it's not a element of the bylaw that's actively monitored, and it just allows for neighbors to call out people and cause strife, right? Like I'm in Purple Hill, there is nightly parking here all summer long on every single road in this division. It's not just me that does it, but I'm the only one that gets called out on it. And I feel that this is just an ability for my neighbor to target me because he has some sort of vendetta against me. Okay. Um, what's the wish of council? Do you want this uh, item to be brought back? Yes, uh, Deputy Mayor? Um, Justin, thank you for your uh, your question. Um, I, like Fred, think that we should give this some thought. I'd be curious as to how frequently it's enforced. Uh, and uh, I understand uh, prohibitions in the winter for uh, purposes of uh, removal of snow, but uh, I think we need to take a longer look at this, frankly, and have it come back at a future meeting. Okay. And I'm seeing uh, Fred Nix nodding. Uh, Ralph, Sharon, are you fine for a future meeting? Okay. So, um, Justin, I will uh, ask the clerk, uh, Mr. Simpson, that when this item is being brought back to a future council meeting, that you are contacted in advance so that you can either log in or uh, call in again to, to hear the discussion and to participate. Excellent. Thank you, Laura. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Fred Simpson, the next question. So the next question is from Mr. Emilio Sestra, and he's asking when the upgrades will be completed to the water tower. And uh, as we're not quite sure what, what upgrades that he's referring to, as this question just most recently came in overnight, um, it may take some follow-up to understand the, the nature of the question. Okay. Yeah, because it 
we don't know that there's any upgrades to water um, service, but maybe uh, the upgrades are uh, in relation to the uh, internet providers that are accessing the tower contracts. Okay, so if there's nothing further under public question period, then we will continue on. Um, we have a delegation scheduled for 9.30, and so we have a few minutes that we can go into unfinished business. So if we look at the list of unfinished or deferred council business, is there any changes or additions that uh, council members would like to see? Yes, Fred? Well, it isn't a change, but it has the, the water, joint water management agreement work? I, I am assuming we know nothing yet. I, I just, I'm, I'm a bit worried. That, that item is way overdue. Mark, should, should we phone Chris, or, or what, what do we do? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll uh, get in contact with Chris. I haven't heard anything from Chris recently, either on this particular file or even with uh, uh, the Aragon well drilling that he was actively working on. So I'll follow up with Chris. I don't know whether he's on uh, having summer vacation or what, So, but I will follow up and get an answer back to Council. Okay, is there anything else on the list? Yes, John? Uh, just a general comment. Um, I'd like to see a few more um, estimated uh, due dates uh, introduced. I, I know that people are busy, and uh, but I think that it, having the rigor of a few um, targets would be a good thing. Okay. Yes, Mark? So if there's nothing further, then we will carry on to the second, the DEFRAN POA disbursements, the second quarter. And, um, oh, sorry, down the wrong section. Uh, Blue Heron Drive survey results. And I know that uh, Fred Nix was active with this and um, Andrews provided a compilation of the survey and uh, Fred, did you want to start us off? Yeah, just um, I, uh, from Andrew's report, it wasn't Andrew's fault, but the response rate was pretty poor. I think it was 15 out of 50. And if one more has come in since then, I understand. But we only actually distributed approximately 40 surveys. It, it, I'm, I'm going on memory, Your Worship, but I think there was 35 houses on Blue Heron, and then we did a few on the that other road. So I we didn't... We would have been lucky to hit 40. So I think the response was 16 out of 40. Okay. And I guess my, my comment would be, we asked them, they've given an answer. Um, I know there's going to be a couple of individuals who are not too happy uh, with it, but I, I don't know. I don't know how democracy works. We asked them what they wanted. They say they want a keypad lock on the, on the gate into, uh, conservation area. So I, I guess, Mike, we haven't heard from you um, how expensive that is to do, because uh, I think the gate has to be rebuilt. So before we make a firm decision on that, do you, you want to give us an estimate of the cost? So we're still waiting. We're struggling with a few operational issues right now. Um, these keypads are mainly battery operated. Um, we can go the full Monty and uh, and you're looking at electrical, electrical based. Um, there's one big concern that, that I'm trying to iron out right now, which is if the battery goes, we actually end up locking people in the Island Lake Conservation Area. So I'm struggling with uh, struggling with operation, um, and uh, I'm still awaiting the quote on the uh, the installation of a of a person gate operational and a double gate for emergency access so so i hope to get that for next council meeting um, but i am struggling with a few operational issues that may may fall out of the uh of the failure of a keypad so okay mike, mike what don't don't laugh why don't we just go for a padlock with a key and if we have to run off 100 
steps of the key that for the neighbors that, that want it, um, we do it. I mean, that, that way we don't have to worry about batteries. If, if they want into the park, they've got a key, they can get in. I, I have no comment on that other than the tree would be would be uh, would or the key would be able to be copied by many individuals. So I, I struggle to find the uh, the value long term value of that. Um, but uh, but I, I I definitely could uh, consider that with a uh, with a combination lock maybe, and then that be it becomes the responsibility of the resident and. Is staff getting called at nine o'clock at night to relock the gate because the last person didn't uh, didn't lock it? Um, I'll, I'll get a few of the operational issues identified in a report by all means, and uh, that was actually a good suggestion, Councillor. Next, thanks. But I would also point out that if we use a keypad lock, people can share the number, and it will it will be shared. So yeah. there's, there's, there's no absolutely perfect way to do this. Guaranteed. Okay, John. Uh, a couple of things. Um, first of all, my motion contemplated uh, a, a discussion with the, the CBC on this issue uh, and on the general principle of, of porous uh, entrances into uh, into their area. Uh, I'm wondering whether they've been contacted, whether that discussion is ongoing. And quite frankly, I think they should bear some of the cost involved in uh, in securing uh, entrances, both uh, at Blue Heron and at Island Lake. Um, John, I did phone the CBC and Bill Lister was on holidays, so I, I drew a blank. Um, second, the second thing is I, I will be bringing a, a motion at some stage uh, to do exactly the same thing over at Island Lake. Um, and that would involve some fencing as well as uh, a controlled uh, access uh, with uh, some sort of uh, hopefully a, a simple mechanical um, um, device attached to, to the gate. Uh, the other issue that was addressed, I think, in the motion was um, appropriate signage at Blue Heron. Uh, we can do anything uh, we want there, and if we don't get the, the point across that this is not an entrance uh, into the CBC that is uh, accessible for uh, anyone other than local residents, uh, you know, one can question the, the, the point of the exercise. So I think we need to look at the signage uh, at that location as well as uh, fixing up the, uh, uh, the gate as it currently exists and adding a control. Um, uh, uh, gate for um, uh, walkers and hikers. Okay, Sharon. Sure. Uh, I would be satisfied to have uh, uh, Mike Dunmore have a discussion with Bill Lidster about all the things that John has suggested, um, sharing cost, but I don't think that should be a deal breaker. And um, I, I think we should wait for Mike to get this figured out before we start making any decision. Okay. Thank you. All right, Mark. Your Worship, I did have a brief discussion with Bill Lidster a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think they're generally, um, I'd say ambivalent to, to the Blue Heron access. It's not part of the approved agreement uh, for access for our residents. Uh, whereas the uh, first line entrance through Island Lake Park was anticipated to be a, a entrance for mono residents uh, into the Island Lake area, similar to the um, um, access to the north and also uh, across from home hardware for the Orange Shoal residents. Um, so if, um, if uh, you're going to task Mike to take that on, uh, I think the costs were something uh, a, a new I first time I've heard this morning. So I think that's something else to bring up with uh, Bill. Okay, Ralph. Uh, Mark, could you just remind us about what the Mono's are arrangement is the CBC? Uh, I, understand, I, I believe we pay a, uh, uh, a sum to them annually. It may be thirty thousand dollars, and and what is that? What do for, we get? For that? that that is for trail maintenance. Um, okay. 
I didn't think it was that much, but uh, I can certainly go through the agreement. I've got the agreement handy, uh, Councillor Mankdala. I can certainly forward it to all of Council. All right. All right. So I, I was misled by uh, some discussion about this being a, a payment for uh, access for Mono residents to CBC as a, 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 a that's a non-starter then. No, it's trail maintenance costs. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And, and your worship, Mark, Mark, you should point out trail maintenance of the Vicky Barron Trail plus the trails we built. They, they've taken over responsibility for that, Ralph. Yeah. The, 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 whatever the loop is called, Kent, the, the uh, anyway, that's on our property. They maintain it. Okay, so this item will come back then uh, after uh, Mike has had an opportunity to review and bring you some uh, further potentials to resolve it. Uh, item three, the parking by permit parking cutouts. So there's a memo from Fred Simpson. Fred? And so uh, as council will call, uh, there are a couple of motions uh, giving direction to staff to uh, investigate and recommend the size and exact locations of the number of the cutouts uh, around various parking spots, but they were predicated on a parking by permit system. So I'm just looking for direction at this point. If uh, council wants staff to continue on uh, making recommendations recommendation on those cutouts, uh, notwithstanding that we don't have a parking by permit only system. Um, and also keeping in mind that subsequent to that meeting, two meetings ago where that was proposed, two parking permits or cutouts were created uh, based on a subsequent resolution. And that one didn't make mention of uh, a by permit only system. So of course those two cutouts have been established. So they're out there. There are a number of other ones that were proposed, but we haven't made them yet pending clarification. Okay, hey, Fred, next. Uh, wait, well, maybe John, did you wanna speak first, John? Uh, I, I was just going to say that my assumption was that uh, we we go ahead with the, uh, the intent of the motion to uh, identify uh, safe cutouts, uh, but that there would be no uh, permit uh, um, uh, involvement, as it were, with with that. So I think the task is the same, and that is to identify, uh, uh, for Council's consideration, cutout options at other locations, and I think I listed a few as examples only. Um, and I'd look forward to uh, to seeing those those recommendations, but I think it's important for the public to understand that we have already, already created two uh, cutout areas in popular uh, hiking spots on the perimeter of the uh, park. Okay, Fred, next. Yeah, and in John's original motion, he had just listed some possible places, I guess, as examples. One of them, and I think he did this inadvertently, John, you can correct me if I'm wrong, because he had a parking spot by Cannings Falls which I can assure you has caused my phone to ring a little bit. I so so Mike, that that was it put in that John's list inadvertently. Take that off, as you know, Mike, because we were there with the Bruce Trail. They're going to be building a, a fence, so there'd be no point in parking on the first line by Canyons Falls. The spots, in, in addition to the two we've already identified, which are 25 Side Road and First Line South of 25 Side Road, I would. Uh, and, and, and Ralph, I think we discussed this yesterday. I believe, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, on the second line going up to the Outdoor Education Centre, we've made it no parking all the way, have we not? So there was a cutout that was allowed in my report that I provided to Council, but, but Council, when we closed down all entrances other than third line, that was taken out. Second line north of 20 Side Road is probably our safest location, least impactful to residents entering into the park. Um, I'll just leave that uh, that food for thought for council. 
So I'd like that spot put back in, particularly from the cemetery uh, going north. I don't know how far, but but I, I don't see a problem with, I don't know, someone pick a number, 10, 12 cars parked there. That, that, that's a traditional entrance to Mono Cliffs Park. The other spot I'd pick, and, and John, you correct me if I'm wrong, but we, we've, have we made no parking on the third line in front of your place? So the signs, uh, the, the bylaw, the bylaw, the way it reads right now is no parking from County Road 8 south to the 15th side road, which is, which is excessive, um, which was very reactive um, during the impact that we had. Um, I have identified some unsafe locations and a much shorter distance, um, but I do think there's a adequate boulevard area for people to safely park on third line and the and to, well to remain uh, to keep the road safety in mind and and if council uh, will leave this with me I'll, I'll take road safety as a priority on all these entrances um the uh, the resultant of the cutouts at 25 side road and second line that I did the other day did not result in a lot of parking spaces. Um, but we, if council will, will, will entertain this, um, that is an intersection, uh, that is a hill, and there's not a lot of uh, boulevard there for roadside parking. So, so it is limited. And there, there, there was some residents that were extremely impacted uh, and <laughs> small frontages. So, so if council, like, like, the, the biggest concern, and, and that was outlined in, in Mr. Simpson's report, was was I, I got a little we got a little confused here because the, because we understood what council wanted, um, but without the permit process, it seemed to run into a little bit of a dead end when we were trying to start the report. But I, if council was good with the cutouts, I would be very good with putting to side putting aside some very safe locations um, uh, to, uh, to allow a minimal number of, of, re of residents to, of, of people in general to utilize access at these, at these locations. Yeah. And, and just arguing for that third line at eight County road eight location. And there it is the boulevard there is why and very kindly the grass is cut by a local resident. <laughs> My dog. Um, that that like that is a historic place because it's the it's the meeting place of two of the Bruce Trail clubs. So the the, the the hike leaders quite often will start or end a hike right at that point, and they they don't. That doesn't entail a lot of cars, four or five cars. I don't know, but uh, so that that is a traditional place for hike leaders in the Bruce Trail to start or end a hike. Well, I, th I think, and agreed, agreed, and I, I think our intent here is to try and avoid um, the unsafe conditions that were posed uh, were posed by the by the the influx of people. This is going to happen again in the fall. Uh, council is aware of that. We we we've, we've dealt with this yearly, and and irregardless of pandemic or the certain situation in time, uh, we're going to be dealing with this in the fall inside of this report that I will provide to council, I think I'll be recommending uh, the executive order be utilized during these times, uh, just to, just for road safety and, and, and trying to, uh, um, we're not going to stop the parking. We've already seen the two cutout areas, or sorry, one of the cutout areas um, fill up and, uh, and tickets were, were administered in the, the newest no parking area. So, so I don't think we're ever going to, to, uh, to stop it, and the revenue will offset the cost of, of this venture right now. Your Worship, could I just mention one more spot? You're going to look at the third line, Mike, and that's good. And I agree with you. There are certain parts of it, particularly as it goes south and winds around those two S turns, where clearly you would not want parking for safety reasons. There is one tiny spot before you get to the 15 side road. And it's where the Bruce Trail goes off the road and up the escarpment. That, that's not a big place for hikers to park, 
uh, and, I, and I know we've already issued permits to the, the uh, Dufford Highlands Bruce Trail Club, but we haven't issued any to the Caledon Hills Bruce Trail Club. That is a spot that for trail maintenance purposes, we have a very um, difficult ladder up the escarpment there. And if on, on occasion, very on occasion, like once a year, someone has to park there and go up there and do a bit of maintenance. There's, there's room for about one car if you push it on the west side of the road, a bit into the vegetation. And I, my personal observation is it's safe to park like that. Could, could you look at that, Mike? A hundred percent. I think we have to start to try and be very rational with our lengths of our, of our no parking areas. Like uh, if you look at Mono and the topographic uh, of the roads, we could have no parking areas everywhere. Um, the, the beauty of our roads is, is, is an issue for, for people that like to sightsee. Um, but uh, that's where I hope, and, and through our, our parks working group or, or, or the CAO, Mark Early, and myself, to have a discussion with the OPP, because our bylaw does have tools for, um, I'm trying to word this nicely, um, people that do not understand they are parking on the side of a traveled roadway. And our parking bylaw has tools for that. Um, we've, somehow we've got into uh, signing signing this um, to to remind them, but uh, um, but there 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 is tools, and we hope the OPP will look at this from a road safety uh, perspective in the influx of, of visitors at any of our um, at any of our trail access points across Mono. And, and and should there be a complaint, then the police attend, and and uh, perhaps towing may be the road safety issue that needs to be dedicated. So so that's something that Mark Mark and I can definitely speak to the OPP about about full enforcement of our uh, of our our line items inside of our bylaw, and we can also talk to our bylaw enforcement and see how their comfort level is about enforcing uh, the unsafe section of the uh, of our bylaw. Okay, Ralph. Um, I like the way the discussion is going here. Um, uh, we're not going to need permits. That's uh, I think we all agree with that, and that uh, we let Mike um, use his knowledge and discretion to decide um, the size of the cutouts. We made a mention about the uh, uh, second line uh, north of Mono Center. Um, it wasn't a threat. It wasn't from the. Uh, uh, Cemetery North that was less than that, but it was somewhere between 15 and 20 cars that were available there when we first set up, and that is a popular place, and it's not a problem there, in my my view. So I think so. We we should just uh, sit, sit back and let Mike come up with his uh, recommendations, and uh, uh, as a permit-free uh, parking cutouts uh, that are necessary. Okay, so I think we've had ample discussion. Yes, John. I, I just wanted to, to um, partially answer and clarify. Uh, my position on the third line, I have declared uh, an interest because the uh, third line is adjacent to uh, to the uh, eastern boundary of my property. So um, I'm not going to weigh in on that, um, but uh, I may have something to say when this comes back to council with regard to the balance of the third line uh, south of our property. Okay. So we'll leave it in your hands, Mike, until such time as you're ready to come back with uh, your suggested operations. Uh, so at this time, uh, we have a delegation from Watson and Associate, Associates. Um, and we, uh, where is uh, Andrew? Andrew Gunda. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Just fine. And lovely to have you here. And I understand that you're going to present uh, Share your screen. There it is. Great. Uh, shall I proceed then? Yes, you may. Thank you very much. Uh, so again, it's a pleasure to be um, before council today. The um, purpose of the presentation today is uh, with respect to the development charges bylaw of the town and an a proposed amendment to that bylaw. Um, the intent uh, of the meeting today is to review the, the DC update study that was provided uh, 
which is the basis for the, uh, the development charge. It um, is a requirement that that background study be made available to the public at least two weeks prior to the public meeting, which it has. Uh, and also that it's available on the municipality's website at least 60 days prior to passage of the bylaw, which will be uh, before that bylaw amendment comes forward to council for your consideration. And so, and so the purpose today, again, is to provide a summary uh, of the proposed amendment to answer any questions that, that council or the public may have. Uh, and so this matter, when it comes forward to council, uh, we'll have uh, moved through that statutory public process requirement. So the amendment itself is an amendment to bylaw 2019-42, which is the, uh, the town's development charge bylaw that came into effect on July 31st of 2019. Um, the principal reason for the amendment was that the Development Charges Act was amended um, through the More Homes, More Choice Act and the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Act. Um, some of those amendments have, have been in effect in municipalities uh, since uh, January of, of 2020. Others uh, have come into effect as of September of uh, that same year. And so we wanted to amend the bylaw uh, to reflect the fact that there is more funding now available um, for what's commonly referred to as soft services, which I'll explain a bit more in detail in a moment. Um, and also that there are changes to the, the timing of the required payment of development charges uh, and uh, rules with respect to the collection of those DCs based on certain types of development. And so while we were preparing this uh, background study for the purpose of amended changes, what was also discussed with town staff was the effectiveness of the underlying capital cost estimates in the 2019 background study and whether those need to be adjusted. And also looking at the capital needs, if there was any changes that were required. And so you'll see that there are some changes uh, that are required specifically with respect to transportation and to parks and recreation that have also been identified uh, in that update study again, which I'll highlight uh, through my presentation today. But other than those that I'm, I'm making specific reference to in the presentation, as you'll see in our update study, all of the other uh, components of the 2019 DC background study and bylaw 2019-42 uh, remain in effect um, and, and not proposed for change through this amendment. So in terms of the additional funding now available for, for soft services, the Development Charges Act um, previously required that if there were services that are commonly referred to as soft services, and in your bylaw, these would be the services of library, parks and recreation, and growth-related studies. Um, those soft services previously, the Act required a mandatory 10% deduction be made from the growth-related capital costs to be funded from taxation revenue. Um, they've since removed that as a result of the, um, the amendment to the Development Charges Act. And so one of the amendments in the update study is to remove that deduction to provide additional funding for those services. The other adjustments that were made were in discussion with staff, uh, particularly as it pertains to transportation and parks and recreation by identifying additional projects that should be included as well as updating some capital costs based on recent experience. Um, there was also adjustments made to fire protection and what is currently in the bylaw under administration or growth related studies to allow for the studies to be included directly in the respective services. So while we had identified um, master plan for, part, for fire in the prior study, under the administration component that's now been moved into fire protection services and the growth related studies have been allocated to the eligible services as those study uh, by themselves are no longer considered an eligible service but the, the cost of those studies have been uh, maintained and included in the respective service areas and so what you'll see summarized in that 
uh, development charge update study uh, that is on the municipality's website and underlying the amendment is changes to the capital projects uh, and the DC eligible capital costs. So as you can see in this table in the 2019 DC background study, the DC recoverable capital costs for the forecast period uh, of the subsequent 10 years was about $3.2 million. With the amended uh, changes, that will increase to about $4.1 million um, or more specifically an increase of $940,000. When we look at um, how those charges are provided by the respective services, as you can see, the largest increase is for transportation services. That is reflective of the update to the bridge program that was identified by adding bridges five and 36 and updating the associated cost of the expected bridge improvements. Also, the costs were updated with respect to the sand, salt, and storage facility, and two additional vehicles were identified for the future maintenance of roads, being a service vehicle and an additional backhoe. Um, with respect to parks and recreation, uh, in reviewing the underlying cost estimates for staff, it was estimated that they should be updated to uh, include uh, more accurate pricing with respect to the tennis courts, um, also to make adjustments to the rural trail program, removing the Mono Center expansion that was anticipated, and then identifying additional projects that were identified uh, for new snow clearing equipment for the trail system, uh, a multi-purpose pad in the Purple Hills Park, uh, a sun shelter, two additional pickleball, pickleball courts, and an expanded uh, parking at uh, Menorah Park. Um, and that resulted in an increase in the recoverable cost of about 250,000 for that service. Uh, as you can see, the changes for fire protection, again, is largely reflective of the um, share of the fire master plan costs that have been moved into that service specifically. The increase for library is reflective of the removal of the 10% statutory deduction. And the administrative studies um, component has increased by about 9,000, which is reflective of the cost of preparing this amendment and the associated bylaw and public process. Can, can so, I ask a question as you go along? Can I ask a question? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to do that. On the fire protection services, the, the thing that caught my mind, and I don't have a number, but I have raised the red flag several times to my fellow council members and to staff about the Shelburne District Fire Board. It is going to have to do something about its fire halls. We don't know the cost, but we're, we're banting around the number of like $2 million. Um, I don't know when that's going to occur, but it's going to be a big ticket item. And our share is about 10% of that. And when I looked at your fire protection service number, and it really hasn't changed much since 2019, I guess my question is, has that been taken into account in this study? Yes, so the, the prior DC study include vision with respect to um, future facility space requirements for fire under that shared service arrangement. Um, one of the, and, and where that provision comes from is that the act requires municipalities to look at their historic level of service. So what is your, your obligation under that agreement for the space that you, uh, or the funding of the space that you've had previously? Um, and what that does is it produces a maximum amount that could be included. So we've maintained that maximum funding available um, for future facility requirements if necessary. And because you're at that maximum, there was no ability to make any further changes from that. So you are saying that maximum number that you allowed for did include the either rebuilding or major renovation of the Shelburne Fire Hall? Yeah, so again, a renovation um, or a replacement wouldn't necessarily be eligible to be included in a development charge. In a development charge, what we need to be able to uh, identify is the increase in capacity to service new development. So if, if as a result of that, there was increased capacity to accommodate additional vehicles, to address 
calls as related to development, then, then it can be considered. And so the, the thinking is, is that uh, in the future, there, there may be a requirement for additional capacity. And so those provisions have been maintained. Okay, so, um, so then in terms of the, the impacts of the additional 940,000 in additional costs over the forecast period, you'll see in the update study, the revised schedule of charges. And so the, the structure of the charges are maintained where the charges are imposed based on the type of residential building, as you can see here, whether that's a single family home apartments differentiated between large and small by, by the number of bedrooms or other multiple dwellings like townhouses or road dwellings. And then also the charges for non-residential development imposed on a per square foot basis. And so the updated charges as you see here on a service by service basis would, would see the chart, the new charge that could be imposed on single and semi-detached units at $15,805. The charges for the other dwelling unit types lower, reflective of their underlying occupancy. And the non-residential charge at $8.59 a square foot. And so to put those revised scheduled charges in some perspective, we've provided a comparison of those charges to the current charges that are imposed. Um, again, when we compare the charges for a single detached unit today within the town's bylaw, that charges $12,161. The proposal uh, as a result of the amendment would see that increase $1,805 or an increase of approximately $3,600 per unit or about a 30% overall increase in the, the charge that would be payable to the town. The non-residential charge, which is applicable for all non-residential uses, whether it's commercial, industrial, or institutional, that current charge today at $6.69 per square foot would increase to $8.59 a square foot, or an increase of about $1.90 a square foot, uh, representing about a 28% increase. And so that's slightly less than the charge uh, on a percentage basis that you see for residential. And principally that's because a smaller amount of the, the cost of service for parks and recreation is borne by residential, or sorry, by non-residential, uh, with more of that cost being attributed to the residents that those, those assets would be servicing. So when we look at those charges in a broader context, then what we wanted to do was to look at the total development charges payable, in this case for a single detached residential unit. As you'll see, the, the bar graph shows the total development charge, not only including the town's development charge, but the charges paid to the county and to the school board. And so when we look at the current fee indicated by the, the dark gray arrow, the charge is $17,472 a unit, approximately $12,000 to the town, about $3,600 to the county and $1,700 per unit to the school board. So the town represents about 70% of that total development charge payable. The proposed fee, uh, as we mentioned earlier, would see that increase um, to the new charge. Uh, that new charge would be about 21% higher than the current rate today, uh, with the town share increasing from about 70% of that total to 75%. And by comparison to the other municipalities uh, in the county, what we see is that the charges would be comparable to those in Shelburne in the school road area. They're also comparable with um, the municipality of Agila Tassarano, but higher than the charges imposed uh, by some of the other area municipalities within the county. Um, the charges by comparison to Orangeville are about $8,000 less per single detached unit with respect to, to their charge and considerably less than we see uh, as imposed in the town of Caledon with their charges uh, exceeding $60,000. The non-residential charges, we've looked at two illustrations here. The first is a comparison of a charge for commercial development. And so we can see that the, the 
current charges today are about $15 per square foot. The town representing about 45% of that total charge, uh, the majority of it being represented by the county for their respective services. Uh, the proposed fee would see that charge increase by about 12% overall, uh, with the town share increasing to about half uh, of the overall BC payable. Uh, those charges would be comparable with the town of Orangeville, uh, but higher than the charges we see in some of the other area municipalities of the county. And when we look at similar charges for industrial, uh, the town does not differentiate or provide any exemption or reduction for industrial development. Uh, and so you'll see your respective positioning is a bit different as compared to commercial. And that's because municipalities such as Orangeville and Grand Valley exempt industrial development charge development from payment of development charges. And you'll also see that Calvin's position is relatively lower because the reduced rate is imposed for those types of uses within the region of appeals bylaw. So that uh, provides a summary of the change in the charge and a comparison uh, of its impacts. In terms of the policies, as I mentioned, there were some changes that are now required under the Development Charges Act with the subsequent amendments. And so what has been uh, reflected in the amending bylaw is to bring the bylaw into compliance with the act. Um, some of the changes that are noted are with respect to the imposition of the charge itself. So under your current bylaw today, a development charge is fully payable at the time of building permit issuance. The Development Charge Act has changed those rules with respect to certain types of development, where now if a rental housing development or an institutional development is being undertaken, the charges are no longer payable in full at the time of building permit issuance, but are rather paid uh, in six annual installments commencing with the first payment on the date of occupancy. If the development is for not-for-profit housing, then it's over 21 annual installments. Those charges would be made. Um, also, a further change that's required under the Act is that if that building permit issuance is as a result of an approval through uh, a Planning Act approval of site plan or zoning bylaw amendment. And as long as that's occurred within the permitted period of two years after that planning application approval, then the charge is not calculated based on the rates in effect at the time of building permit issuance, but rather the rates that were in effect the day they submitted the planning application for the site plan or zoning bylaw amendment application. The Act allows town to impose interest on those deferred uh, charges or those installment payments. Um, in discussion with the town and in consideration with other municipalities uh, that have imposed certain policies in this regard, what is being proposed is that the rate of interest equivalent to the Bank of Canada prime rate on January 1st of each year plus 2% be the rate that would be imposed that that rate would be fixed throughout the duration of the installment payments and that the uh, the policy would identify that this would the maximum amount would either be the charge paid plus interest or the rate that would be in effect if the charges were not frozen as required under the act and so this will be detailed uh, specifically in the town's interest policy that will come forward to council for your consideration and approval on September 14th so that it'll align with the bylaw amendment. In addition to those required changes to the collection uh, rules of a bylaw, there's also a change to the statutory exemptions. So the statutory exemptions are those developments that the Act does not allow municipalities to impose development charges on. Um, and so historically, one of those exemptions was that if you had an existing residential building, you could add up to two additional apartment units within the building if it was a single detached home. Um, and those units would be exempt from payment of development charges. What has changed now 
is that the Development Charges Act allows those additional units to be created on the same lot, but detached from the principal residential building. So if somebody was to build a granny suite on the same lot, if they were to build a uh, second uh, accessory unit above a, a detached garage, for example, those would now be exempt where previously they were not. The Act also allows the same rule to apply for new development. So if you have a new residential building being constructed, they're allowed to add one additional dwelling unit either within the building or detached from that building on the same lot, and that additional second lot would be, or second uh, dwelling would be exempt. The non-statutory exemptions remain unchanged. The bylaw currently provides for exemptions for non-residential farm buildings and temporary uses. Those are being maintained. And so other than those collections and exemptions that I've noted, all other rules within the bylaw would uh, be maintained and not amended through this process. And so that concludes the, the summary of the update study and the proposed bylaw. Uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, the purpose of the meeting today is to, to hear from the public and council and answer any questions that uh, the individuals may have. And then this bylaw is expected to come forward to council on September 14th uh, for your consideration and approval, witnessing the 60 day uh, period of having the background study on the municipality's bylaw. And then that bylaw would come into um, after the date of, of passage. And so uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to address those. Okay, before we, I entertain questions for you, Andrew, uh, we do have a housekeeping um, item, which was uh, we should have uh, passed this motion that we adjourn the regular meeting of council and go into a public meeting to discuss the development charges by law amendment. So could I have someone move that motion, moved by Martin and seconded by Nix, and uh, that is carried. Thank you. So now, um, any questions from uh, council members on the report from Andrew? Yes, John? Uh, Madam Mayor, um, two, qu two questions for Andrew. We've had a, um, an objection uh, received in writing uh, with regard to the, the size of the, uh, of the increase. But if I'm not mistaken, if this individual were to uh, apply for a building permit and pay the development charge prior to this uh, uh, new um, bylaw going into effect, they, they would be basically paying at the older rate. Is that not correct? Yes. Uh, if I could jump in, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, I talked to Mr. La Capricia, uh, at least by, by email, and I told him that exact thing. If, uh, if you make an applicant, you can prepay your development charges to passage of the bylaw and then that rate would be the current rate. And then he would have up to five years uh, to build his residential home. He seemed happy Thank with that, know. but he was still submitting his comment. Yeah, fair enough. Um, second question, uh, accessory buildings, Andrew, uh, are they captured by development charges? It, accessory buildings are. So if you have a um, a non-residential accessory building. So it's, it's deemed to be a commercial, industrial or institutional building uh, that's added on the property, then the development charge would apply. Um, as we've seen with the non-statutory, sorry, the statutory exemptions for residential, um, if there are accessory residential dwelling units within certain limitations of the act, they would be exempt from payment. Um, but with residential, it's based on the addition of a dwelling unit. So if somebody was building, say, an accessory garage to a principal residential unit, because that's accessory to the residential use and it's not adding a residential dwelling unit per se, just a garage, uh, then that garage would not be charged. So uh, a, a structure that is uh, uh, described as a workshop uh, personal storage accessory to a residence does not attract development charge. That's correct, unless that 
garage uh, was to go through a change of use and you know be considered under the municipalities uh, planning uh, as a, a commercial use for example and and if if the uh, if the use changes uh, what is the uh, development charge uh, owing? Is it based on when the uh, structure was uh, erected or is it based on uh, when the uh, use is deemed to have changed? It, it's at the time the use is deemed to have changed. So if you have a, a change of use, which would then trigger a building permit, when the issuance of that building permit was to occur, they would look at the, the space uh, and calculate the development charge payable. Okay, so, so the, the change from uh, a benign um, uh, accessory building to something that is uh, more commercial or, or uh, manufacturing would in fact attract a, a development charge. That's correct. Thank you. Okay, any other questions of Andrew from council members? Yes, Ralph? Uh, thank you, Andrew, that, that was a good explanation. Although uh, this isn't a part of your um, your presentation, it uh, makes a difference to the person who's paying it. I'm asking, um, how are the educational and the upper tier charges determined? Sure, it's a good question. So the the um, the county and the school board, like the town, have the ability to impose charge bylaw or a development charge through a bylaw. Um, and so the county has to go through the same process as the town, preparing a background study based on the impact of development on their respective services. So they're looking at the impacts on their county roads and the other services that they would be providing as an example. Um, the school boards similarly are allowed to impose an educational development charge for additional land for future school construction. And so again, similar to yourselves, uh, the county and the Board of Education have to go through the, the same uh, similar public process um, of preparing a background study, going through a public process to itemize the, the rationale behind that, and then adopting their bylaw. Okay, any other questions? from council. Seeing none then, uh, do we have anybody logged in on the meeting uh, with questions of this item? Or further comments from the public? Okay, seeing none then, thank you, Andrew, for your uh, in-depth uh, explanation of these changes. And we will um, close off the public meeting and resume the regular meeting of council. Could I have a motion, um, a mover, please? John and Ralph to second. And that's carried. And now we have a prepared motion that we receive the presentation from Watsons and Associates on the development charges background study and direct that a development charges bylaw amendment be brought to council on September 14th, 2021. Could I have a mover? Moved by Martin and seconded by Nix. Any further discussion? Call for the vote. Is anyone opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Thank you for joining us today, Andrew. Thank you. Okay, so now we are on to the item four on unfinished business, the pay equity analysis and employee salary market review. We have a motion prepared that council approve the ML consulting 2021 compensation update and authorize the treasurer to implement the changes therein. We also have a memo from Les regarding the proposed uh, changes. Is there any questions on the item? Yes, Ralph. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Les, when when would uh, if, if this was approved? When would this uh, um, begin? Would this be 
when would the changes do come into place? Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, per my recommendation, um, this this amount can be accommodated in the 2021 budget. So I'm recommending that it gets updated uh, for this year. So basically, it would go would go back to January the first, because okay. council would be adopting uh, this new 2021 salary grid. And then when we we got to uh, next January um, and we had a possibility of a cola increase, would that be a, a, a added to it? Uh, yes, yes, it would be. Now I do like to bring to council's attention. Uh, Though there was uh, increases in, in some of the bands, not every band received an increase. Uh, so there was no uh, market increase in salaries for band number five and band number four. And just, and of course, band number five uh, is where our public works operators fall in and our caretaker staff in the other band. So that's almost half of our staff are not affected with this market uh, update. So uh, they, I'm assuming they would be looking forward to a COLA increase in 2022. Okay. Fred? You got nothing? Okay, John? Uh, Fred, Fred did uh, come in there. I'll Step aside for Fred. Well, he, he said he's he's fine. Oh, so. okay. Um, the, the concern I always have with these sort of uh, uh, catch-up uh, uh, market studies is that uh, combined with COLA, the spread between the highest and the lowest paid employees simply gets greater and greater. Uh, and I don't know what you do about that. But um, it just strikes me that at some point it, it becomes indefensible uh, that the separation uh, widens uh, over time to the extent that it does. Um, as I say, I, I don't know what to do about it, but it is concerning to me uh, and it must be uh, demoralizing to the people who see uh, the spread or who are aware of the spread uh, based on uh, sometimes the uh, sunshine list, which is the public disclosure of salaries over $100,000. And I, I'm going to leave it at that, but I just have to be on the record as saying that uh, uh, I'm, I'm troubled by uh, a, uh, a system that uh, it, it, it increases the inequities between um, vigils all of whom are working hard. If I could make a comment through you, Madam Mayor. Yeah. Uh, I do not disagree with uh, Deputy Mayor. I think we have two factors working here with this market uh, update. Uh, normally this would have been conducted last year. And because we have the, now we're doing it like in our fifth year, it's an additional year. So uh, a lot of municipalities, including our comparators, did their update last year. So this update did have the benefit of that updated information from the other municipalities last year. Uh, second factor is the COVID factor. I know we're getting tired of hearing that, but uh, the increases are in the top, top of our grid. And I'm sure everyone's hearing top executives because of the pandemic uh, are, are leaving. So there is more pressure to get high end uh, staffing uh, at different levels, including municipalities. So those are the two factors that, are, that have affected this market's update that were not in place at the last market update in 2016. Okay, yes, John? If, if, if I may uh, just add another uh, comment. Uh, somebody was in touch with me with regard to the list of comparators and uh, asking out loud why we were uh, comparing ourselves to, to certain municipalities where uh, the population is greater, uh, the services are more extensive. And I, I think they should be aware, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Les, but uh, the comparator list uh, is uh, somewhat uh, uh, whittled down when it comes to 
uh, looking at specific uh, uh, positions. It's not necessarily used across the board uh, without, uh, without critique. So while you may see a, a municipality on that list that you think shouldn't be there uh, due to population size, it doesn't mean that we are taking our cue or, or rounding, uh, rounding up on the basis of uh, comparing to, to large, uh, large towns. Uh, yes, that, that is correct. Uh, yeah. way of expressing it. <laughs> yeah, yes, you are correct. And I mean, uh, the county of Dufferin is a comparator, and you are correct, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, we use uh, generally the public works operators. Uh, a snowplow operator is a snowplow operator. There's only one way to plow snow, and the county does rural roads. Uh, we have rural roads. The county may have some hard surfaces, and so does Mono. So uh, you're correct, and some of the bigger municipalities, uh, it was a pick and choose uh, where there was a better fit as from a staff to staff, position to position comparison. Now, in some positions and the higher bands where the comparison was not, as you say, maybe comparable, then that, that was not used that position. So you are correct, Deputy Mayor. So it's, it's not used yet, it's still on the list leading people to, to believe that it, it may have been used when in fact it hasn't been. Uh, I think that's very important to understand. Um, it, it does lead to some, uh, I guess, misunderstanding, yes. And I guess the other point that needs to be raised is that uh, certain municipalities are on that list because from the standpoint of, of uh, of uh, migration of, of talent, there's always the possibility of a, of a, um, a, a the, there's always the temptation uh, of somebody going to a, a neighboring municipality. Uh, so they're in effect competitors uh, potentially of, of, of us. And, and likewise, uh, we have to stay competitive to attract uh, talent to, uh, to our staff uh, as well. That's correct. Okay, so if there's nothing further, the motion that we approve the ML Consulting 2021 compensation update and they authorize the treasurer to implement the changes therein. Could I have a mover? Moved by Martin and seconded by Mangtelo. And any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Is anyone opposed? There is none, so that's carried. Thank you, Les. Yes. Okay, thank you, Council. Okay, so item five, OPP detachment board composition, Town of Brown Valley request for consideration of OPP detachment boards. <clears throat> so, John? Um, I, I was just going to point out the, the irony of the fact that uh, Grand Valley endorsed our, our original model. Uh, the one that they um, uh, propose here is is not dissimilar, uh, except that it uh, maintains uh, separate uh, boards for uh, Shelburne and, and Orangeville, respectively. Um, I think we should still stand behind our original model. Uh, I think it was workable, uh, and um, I think it's going to it's going to get sorted out somewhere uh, between our model and and the Grand Valley proposal. Um, what we still have to, to wrestle with is the fact that the province uh, is not backing off its insistence on naming people to uh, uh, to our uh, our police service boards, and uh, unnecessarily so, in my view. Uh, I think our uh, uh, public appointees are, are perfectly capable of representing the uh, uh, the interests of the public in their in their respective municipalities. Okay. And any other comments from council members on this? Yes, Fred? Yeah, just I would say I support what John said. Okay, so um, Fred Simpson, is it a requirement that we uh, send a written response or motion? What What is the requirement? Back to Grand Valley. Grand Valley certainly would like to hear back from us. Uh, it doesn't have to be a motion, but they uh, they definitely would like to hear what council's position is. Okay. Um, 
is it possible then, John and uh, Fred, would, would you be able to draft a letter of response from council? Would that be appropriate? Um, I think Mark Mark had something, uh, Madam Mayor. Yes, Mark? Um, I, I believe it was about six weeks ago, a couple of months ago, when we last discussed this, the direction was for us to forward uh, the town's position directly to the Solicitor General's office. So I think we could just reflect that uh, going back to Grand Valley without, a, okay. you know, without much uh, uh, addition. Okay, so... Uh, if I Go could ahead. ask, though, there was this um, uh, portal that we were supposed to log into and fill out a fairly lengthy um, uh, questionnaire uh, with regard to um, profiling our municipality and indicating the, the model that we, we want. And um, I don't know whether Grand Valley is, is offering to do that on our behalf uh, or whether we should do that in addition to uh, relying on the, the transfer of our position directly to the uh, Solicitor General. But I, I wouldn't want it to be said that we neglected use of that portal uh, when they're determined that every municipality uh, use it or at least one representative municipality use it on behalf of uh, all others. So I don't know how that portal fits into the scheme of things now. Any comments, Mark? Um, I can talk to uh, Megan at uh, Grand Valley to see uh, whether that was her intent. I think that was Grand Valley's attempt was to try to get a common ground. That's not going to happen. We're not the first dissenting um, municipality. Um, so it may be it, it may be between the two of us, or or just have Megan do the lead and just say that these are the two or three options that have come from from Dufferin, and that there is no agreement. It's going to have to be something to that effect. Okay, so uh, then council is directing you to um, make it so, then Mark. <laughs> okay. Okay, so if there's nothing further on that, we uh, continue on to bylaws correspondence new business. Uh, the first one is a bunch budget amendment for the tandem snowplow. And um, we have the memo from Les explaining. And so we do have a motion that council makes a budget amendment by authorizing the treasurer to transfer funds from the vehicle replacement reserve to finance the cost of the two 2022 international tandem in the amount of $292,531.01 HSD inclusive. Could I have a mover? Moved by Nix and seconded by Martin. And is there any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Is anyone opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Thank you. And the next one is the Town of Shelburne Service Delivery Review. And so that's been sent by Denise Morrissey. Um, so all of the times and dates have gone past, except for tomorrow. So what is our next uh, opportunity? Yes, Fred. Yeah, just, uh, just a couple of comments. One. I appreciate that they sent uh, the email to our CAO, which is fine, and I would have no objection if our CAO wanted to meet with them to hear to hear them out. But I simply would point out that at the end of the day, it's not our CAO, CAO who would make any decisions on this; it's council. So my view would be that if if Shelburne has something to say to us about the fire board and the possible dissolution of the fire board. Uh, I think they should make a delegation to this council. And in fact, Denise Morrissey makes that possibility in, in the very last sentence of her email to us. And I, I think actually Melanchthon is holding a special council meeting as a, as a council to hear Shelburne out. Um, as far as I know, uh, Mulmer and Amaranth have met uh, either with one staff or one council member with Shelburne, but I believe they're going to take the information they get from those meetings back to their councils. 
So my point is, Your Worship, is it, it's this council that has to make a decision. And I think if Shelburne has something to say to us, we should say, fine, make a delegation to council. Okay. And um, Mark, did you have a comment? Um, I think that's fine. I think the uh, municipalities are moving in different ways. Um, Fred is quite right. Melanchthon is doing a special council meeting. I know they were meeting yesterday with Amaranth. I don't know if that was with full council or a committee of council. So it's, I, I think the choice is up to you at this point, whether you want to hold a special council meeting to meet with them or set a, a committee of council to meet with them and then bring that back to a council meeting. So. Um, at this point in time, we're looking for direction. I think the uh, dates that were provided by um, uh, Denise Morrissey were, were pretty much out of range for um, most of the municipalities anyway. So I think they're just looking for dates that they can uh, come and either meet with council or a committee of council. Okay, Fred, next. Yeah, uh, Mark, I wasn't suggesting that we do a special council meeting. I think they make a delegation to one of our scheduled council meetings. Right, right. I wasn't suggesting that either. I'm just saying Melanchthon did do a special council meeting, so it was just that one issue on, on their plate. And and Mulmer is meeting with them today, and they're meeting with the mayor and the CAO. But they the, the mayor and the CAO are taking whatever they learn back to their council. Okay, so what's the wish of council? Yes, Ralph? I, I think you could go either way, either have a committee meet with them or have them come to council. But I think they might as well come to council and tell us uh, what they uh, what they'd like to do. And uh, hopefully they have a little bit of um, they thought this out a little bit in terms of uh, the uh, the finance, because that's the obvious, one of the obvious uh, disadvantages. And uh, what are the real advantages to this? Uh, this was a review that was done by an outside consultancy. Um, I, I discussed it with uh, with one of them members of that review because of my position on the Rosemont Fire Board and uh, they hadn't discussed, they hadn't any inkling of what was involved with doing, doing a transfer such as this and they really didn't have, didn't have any uh, convincing uh, arguments for the advantage to it. So uh, I'm really surprised that Shelburne are going ahead with this. Um, I'd be happy to hear from Shelburne, um, but that's, uh, you can see where I'm coming from in this. Yeah. So it sounds to me that there is agreement to have them uh, come as a delegation to a uh, council meeting uh, in the near future. So Mark, uh, if you can set that up for us. Okay, will do. I will give them the dates of council. Okay. So uh, item three, investing in Canada infrastructure program regarding transfer payment agreement. That information has been provided by Fred Simpson and um, so, yes, Fred Nix. Yeah, I read most of it. I didn't read all 52 pages of the federal contract. When I got to the end, though, and the, and the agreement between the town and the tennis club, I'm a bit confused as to what interest rate. We're, we're going to loan them the money for their to, to pay their share approximately whatever it is $69,000 minus the $5,000 they have now and we're going to charge them an in interest over whatever it is 14 or 15 years I forget I, I just wasn't clear by the end of that report what interest rate did we agree to and if it's a fixed interest rate if, if, well Ralph Ralph probably has something to say about that and I, and I, I will vote. may probably agree with what Ralph says okay well first of all we're dealing with item three which is the report from Fred Simpson regarding the transfer payment agreement with the ICIP. What you're talking about is number four, correct? You're, you're, I stand corrected, yes. I was okay. jumping down to them. No, oh, okay. So if we can deal with number three, we have a motion that we introduce and give the necessary readings to a bylaw authorizing the town of Mono to enter into a transfer payment agreement with the province of Ontario substantially in the form as attached as Schedule A to the bylaw to receive funds under the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, ICIP, Community Culture and Recreation Stream that be signed by the Mayor and the Clerk for the Town of Mono, sealed and engrossed in the bylaw book. Could I have a mover? Moved by Martin and seconded by Magdalo. And any discussion on the motion? 
Seeing none, I'm going to call for the vote. Is anyone opposed? That's carried then. Okay, so now we're on to item four and the agreement with the tennis club. So, Fred, your question, um, it looks like Kim is prepared to try to volley the question there. Um, the uh, memo that I've put forward to Council um, regarding the agreement um, between the um, tennis club and the town of Mola speaks uh, specifically to what council wants that interest rate to be. Um, our treasurer, Les Haluka, did put um, a proposed interest rate forward to them of 2.95%, which I can let Les speak to his reasoning for that. Um, and they, in turn, um, have requested something lower I'd also like to let Council know that since the publishing of the agenda, I have received a further email from the Tennis Club from Peter Gibson, who's the president, and I'd just like to read that to you now. Uh, this came in uh, Thursday afternoon. Greetings, Kim. We just had our first board meeting during the month of August yesterday. High on our agenda was discussion about the rate of 2.95% pr proposed by the treasurer on monies dispensed by the town on behalf of the club for our new court construction. We unanimous, unanimously agreed that this proposed rate is too high for us to manage. This project is calling on us to fundraise at a level never before experienced by the Mono Tennis Club. At 2.95% interest payments alone during the early years would amount to almost $2,000 per year. Not only have we been hampered during the past 18 months in terms of our capacity to fundraise, but prolonged pandemic related restrictions during the months ahead will continue to prevent us from undertaking many of the fundraising initiatives we are ready to move forward with. Furthermore, we are concerned that the proposed interest rate will appear burdensome to prospective new board members as to prospective new board members we are trying to recruit and a, and a disincentive to become involved in helping to run the affairs of the club. We propose a rate of 1.5%. We have done the projections over the next 10 or 15 years for repayments at 1.5% and are confident we can manage them and that we can enlist the support of our membership for the partnership agreement on these terms. Okay, Fred Nix. Yeah, and I hear what Peter Gibson is saying, and I, I fully admit, uh, you know, we're lucky to have a club like the Tennis Club in Mono. They do a good job. But but I, I think we have to think of the interest of the general taxpayer, because they're asking to borrow from us whatever the exact amount, Kim, $69,000 minus $5,000 they have, so $64,000. Um, if we don't at least get the interest rate that we would have got if that money was in our bank account, it's the, it's the general taxpayer who's providing this subsidy to the tennis club, which may or may not be fair, but, but not all members of, not all residents of Molo necessarily, you know, are, <laughs> are tennis players or, or, or go to the club. I, I, I would also say, like, I'm not opposed to us helping out the tennis club. In, in principle, Kim, we've, we've done it with um, the Moon and Oryx Ski Club because we give them a very subsidized rental rate. We've done it with the rowing club because we forgave them on their $10,000 DC charge and we do it with the lawn bowling club. So it, it's, a, it's a good principle that we have some good clubs that keep people active and engaged. And I think that's great. I'm just quibbling how much this sport should be. And I, I mean, first of all, right off the bat, we're going to loan them sixty-four thousand dollars, which which is pretty nice of us. Les, can you can you tell me? I, I know you've set the two point nine five percent on the basis of prime plus uh, what half a point or whatever it was. I can't I can't get whatever it was. Half a point. Fine. Half a point. Okay. And, and the and reasoning I picked half the half a point. Uh, it is expected the economy over especially over the next fifteen years will start expanding, will start growing, and interest rates will go up. So the 2.95 would be fixed by the term of the 15 years. Now, as Council is aware from our recent presentation of our auditors, 
I did have to dip into our line of credit, and that's what the bank charges us, is prime, the 2.45%. So basically, I had used the prime plus the in anticipation of interest rate increases a half a point. Now, the club makes a comment uh, they should pay what we earn at the bank. But the majority of our investment income we do earn are investments through Wood Gundy and, you know, my dealings with Mr. McKay. Uh, Council has seen a couple of presentations from him. Uh, our, our return last year was over 4%. And we may not hit 4% this year, but it will be, be fairly close. So we are getting good, good return on our funds. Well, I, I still, I'm actually, maybe, Ralph, you want to speak now. I think you had a suggestion. A couple of questions, if I may, Your Honor. Um, I, I re recognizing my um, ailing memory, I, re I realized that we were going to support this uh, with a uh, upfront um, uh, input of about sixty-five thousand dollars, and the and the, uh, the tennis club was going to do the same. Um, could you just give me the history of the discussion where suddenly we're becoming the loaner to the tennis club? I I, I wasn't aware that that, is, that was a, uh, a part of the discussion or a part of the agreement. Yes, what has happened is that due to COVID, um, the tennis club has substantially been um, reduced in their fundraising efforts and as a result as well um, of the fire at the Mono Cliffs Inn. Uh, Mono Cliffs Inn is a huge supporter of the Mono Tennis Club and um, was providing a number of fundraising activities for them. Um, or propose fundraising activities in support of these new courts. Unfortunately, because of those two events, um, the anticipated funds that the club thought that they would have by now has been severely um, depreciated. So they don't, they do not have the funds that they were hoping to have. Um, they're also looking for, uh, looking ahead to the fact that um, the present courts that are out at the center. Um, are set to be um, once again um, resurfaced and that will probably be in the next couple of years. So um, the resurfacing to the courts is approximately 22,000 which we do share with them which is 11,000 so they want to make sure that they have um, that money in the bank to be able to to pay for the um, regular maintenance that we do approximately every 10 years to those courts. So for those reasons, um, the, the tennis club unfortunately is not able at this time to um, put their amount of the loan forward um, or their amount of the um, uh, payment forward. So they have come to us um, asking for a loan. Um, as you mentioned, we have done it in the past. We, we have supported the Menorah Lawn Bowling Club. Back in 2002, we did give them a $35,000 loan over a period of seven years. And um, that was paid back to us actually earlier than the seven years, but um, we did support them in a loan such, you know, similar to this type of thing. So um, they had expected that they do a fundraising and they'd come up with the $65,000 uh, th this year or the last year. That was what you're saying, Kim? Well, they, the fundraising would take over between, um, right, last year, this year, and next year, because the courts are due to be built next year. So now they're looking at a 15-year payment, or, and they're not apparently going to fundraise after this. Uh, so I'm a little bit perplexed at the, at the steps that this uh, has gone. I'm, I'm very supportive of the tennis club, but I, I, I'm concerned about the financial arrangement that's being, being suggested. If we do go and give them a loan, um, we'll be taking uh, another hit, as Fred says, the people of uh, Mona will be taking a hit because that money that we're uh, loaning them, we could uh, have getting 4% or more on it. Instead, we're going to get uh, something less than that. They're, they're proposing a, a quite a low rate. Um, my other thought is, is, is it wise to give them a fixed rate for 15 years, um, particularly if it's such a low rate as this? Fixed rates usually are quite a bit higher, and I know we're not dealing on a commercial basis. 
trying to deal with friends. But um, I would question whether or not the, we shouldn't have a floating rate that was uh, tied to the uh, uh, tied to the uh, prime rate. Okay, Les, did you want to comment on that concept? Um, it's a, the only thing I can say is it is doable. Uh, if it's a rate based on prime rate, uh, as far as administrating that type of loan, uh, similar to our bylaw uh, for the development charge interest policy that's coming to council, we'd have to pick a rate, say on January 1st, whatever prime is, and then we would add the, the, the difference uh, just to keep it simple. Uh, but it is doable. As far as, and, but as, far as being floating, that, that, that would be a decision of council. Okay. John? I'm just going to say that I think we have to be mindful of the fact that anything we do to assist our clubs is a whole lot cheaper than running a large, ambitious recreation uh, program and department that would uh, involve facilities, staff, uh, programming, I mean, I frankly think that the Mono Nordic and, and the tennis club and the lawn bowling people uh, provide a, a service that we would have to deliver in some form or another if they didn't exist. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm supportive of this. I'm supportive of a lower interest rate. Uh, I'm mindful of the 2002 agreement with the lawn bowling uh, group. I uh, also the fact that we were going to loan uh, Mono Nordic uh, monies, but they turned out they didn't need it. Uh, and hopefully uh, the Tennis Club will be in a position to raise monies and hopefully they won't need uh, nearly as much or as long a time to to pay off the uh, the loan. So I, I'm, I'm supportive of it. Um, as I say, if, if they weren't there, we'd have to be doing something I think our residents would expect it. Having said all of that, there is an issue of exclusivity that I think we need to address. Um, and I've said this for many, many years, and that is the clubs, I think, have to be somewhat flexible in terms of allowing non-members access to the facilities because we indeed uh, subsidize and support those facilities. And I don't know what the current schedule is for, for tennis, uh, but I would not be surprised if uh, the, the prime times are, are club times and uh, the general public uh, is then invited to, to pick up uh, other, other times of the day. I'm not sure that's right, and I may be completely wrong, but I think it's a point of discussion for the future. Okay. Sharon, did you have anything you wanted to add to this discussion? Uh, yes, I think uh, what John was saying about the availability of the courts for others to use, the, the tennis club has, has been reaching out to the community and done a really good job, right, Kim, of including people who would not even be anywhere near a tennis court. And I think we, we need, you're, abs you're absolutely right about uh, um, um, providing uh, activities for people who perhaps couldn't afford to be members of the club or play in prime time or even play well it doesn't even matter i would like to see the percentage dropped a bit i have every expectation just as the bowling group did that they will be able to um, have some fundraising events and once those courts are built they will be able to have tournaments which brings in money to um to the club and i i think that perhaps this could be paid back in a shorter time than um than 15 years and i'm sure nobody would object if they paid more than their two thousand dollars a year uh as things went forward um it, in other words an open-ended um arrangement so yes, I would like it to see a little bit lower, but I'm in, in favor of doing this. Thank you. Okay, Fred Nicks. Yeah, just on a minor thing, at 2.95%, the amount they want to borrow would be only $1,800 a year for the first year in interest. 
but th that's minor. The, the, main, the other thing, comment I wanted to make, Kim, is that this is kind of an open-ended agreement, which scares me a bit, in the sense that if there's a cost overrun, we've agreed to split the cost 50-50 with the club. And when I read that, the first thought I had is, remember the, the RFPs we had for the Island Lake Family Park last year, and the tent, when the bids came in, how much higher they were than we expected? So what, what if there's a $200,000 overrun and, and the town's all of, sudden, all of a sudden on the hook for another $100,000? Is there an escape clause here? I mean, we're, we're going to accept the grants, so I, I guess we'd have to give the grants back. But, but what happens if the bids are way higher than we expect? It does say in the agreement that if the if um, the bids come in over, um, or if the project does go, uh, well, for, I'll take this two ways. First of all, if the if the bids come over what the um, the budgeted amount is, then of course we would bring that to council and um, let you know how much over we are, and. Um, council at that time would have to make the decision as to whether or not they wanted to um, go forward with whatever the you know 50 percent of that amount is and and the club would have to um, discuss it as well and and I guess we'd have to also look at whether or not we would you know how much of the club's portion we would take um, it does say in the agreement um, that um, we as a municipality will go forward um, so with with the construction however I'd have to be I'd have to consult with legal as to whether or not um, you know if, if it's over by 200,000 whether or not we would be obliged to go forward that would be something that I would need I would need legal counsel on Okay, so what uh, are you willing to do, Omar? Uh, just one other consideration here. Um, the, the, the way the project is currently set up is we're, we're, we're getting a site plan prepared. We've got to go to the NEC. We've got to get approvals from them. Um, we'll not be constructing till, um, you know, summer next year. Um, we're not going to get our bills in, you know, till, till the end of that. So the first, the, the first time for payment really in invoicing, I think from the town's perspective is not going to be until probably January, 2023. So one would hope we're beyond the pandemic at that point that uh, things will have opened up and, and that we're not into a seventh or eighth wave. Um, hate to be the, you know, the doomsayer. But um, so hopefully in 2023, there's going to be opportunity then for fundraising to occur and, and that this, this um, you know, this loan can be paid back. Uh, I guess one consideration, uh, when Kim and I met with them, we basically got down, uh, the only outstanding point is the interest rate. Um, when we did meet with them, the concern that I've had is a 15 year loan at a very low interest rate and having, you know, our taxpayers uh, uh, carrying that on behalf of the tennis club. So I don't know if there's another way of possibly shortening the um, loans to say 10 years at prime. Um, we're at least covered from, from a, 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 a you know, borrowing basis. And uh, for the most part, you know, we're going to lose that 0.5. But at the same time, going to a shorter rate at 10 years at prime. Um, may be an option to propose to them, given the fact that we're not even going to be invoicing them until 2023. I don't know if Les has anything to, to add to that. Okay. Um, that was going to be my question as a consideration of shortening the loan period or have it reopened after five, six years and renegotiated. Um, and also the other question I had is how soon does this agreement have to be uh, signed if we do to have this window before pay actually be uh, invoiced, made, etc. Does this agreement have to be uh, done right away or can uh, staff continue to work with the club 
to come up with uh, something that they are prepared to endorse. So, uh, Fred Nix. Just, just a mechanical question. Uh, Mark, if, if you don't think our first bills are going to be payable until of January 2023, do we get the grant in the meantime? I mean, those two grants are whatever they are, almost $400,000. I'm just thinking less if, if, if we had $400,000 with Wood Gundy for a year before we get any bills in, we, we actually could earn quite a bit of interest. Could, could we not? When, when would we get the grant? When would that money be in our bank? Um, if I can, if I can just step in there, the terms of the uh, the terms of the grant are that um, it's a payback grant. In other words, um, we submit our bills, we pay the bills, and then as we submit the bills, we get reimbursed. We so we don't get the money up front. Wipe that comment off. I just yeah. so normally based on past grants, if I could jump in, we uh, we would submit our our bills, to, uh, you know, to the funding. Um, every quarter, semi-annually at the latest. So then we'd upfront the money and they would pay their portion as we go along with the, with the project. So uh, Kim, could you uh, make an attempt to answer my question, which is how soon does this agreement need to be finalized? <laughs> Part of the transfer payment agreement um, that council just adopted in the um, previous agenda item is that we do have a term of agreement. We do have a um, agreement with the tennis club. It, and if I can just add one more thing, um, I, I know Mark indicated about shortening the length of the um, payback of the loan. Um, I will say that the tennis club initially came um, to me with a 20 year term for paying that back. And so they have come down to 15 years. So I'm not sure um, what their um, thoughts would be on going to 10. Ralph? Well, if I was a member of the tennis club, I sure wouldn't want this hanging over my head for 20 years. And the sooner you can pay it off, the better. Um, I think we should send it back uh, to um, Les to talk to, or whoever is most responsible here, and to talk to the tennis club, recognizing that we have some concerns for a fixed rate for a long period of time. Um, we all have reasonably good memories about much, much higher interest rates that we've had in the past, and uh, we don't want to be tying our citizens to paying off something as, as too much of a, of a, of a gift. Although. I, I recognize what everybody else has said, that, and John's, John's quite right. These uh, clubs uh, do a service for the community at a very cut rate price. Um, so I, I think that what we've heard here is it'd be nice to do this a shorter length. It'd be nice to change the interest rates, whether we renegotiate them at five years based on the current prime, or we have a, something as uh, has been discussed with a once a year assessment of prime and the, whatever the rate is, whether we we drop it down to prime or less than that um, and uh, and then go forward. Okay, Mark. <clears throat> Mark. Yeah, the so council can approve the agreement. I think council can approve the agreement. It says substantially the same form there as. The only issue we're dealing with at this point is the interest rate. So I could go back. I mean, you could you could get this off your plate uh approve the agreement uh give us some direction on on just where you want us to go back to the tennis club if you're happy with you know 15 years at prime uh negotiated after five um that's uh, you know i i put that out as well um and then we can continue to work with the tennis club see whether we can reach agreement uh and then we either execute the agreement or we don't and the project either goes ahead or fails Okay, <clears throat> Fred? Just for the sake of the public who's watching, it isn't just, it, the issue isn't just that we're loaning them the money to pay their share of this cost. We're already committed to put $69,000 on the table ourselves of taxpayers' money. So, I mean, that's quite a quite a lot of money. And to back to John Creelman's point, that, that Kim, can you tell me how many hours a week is the tennis club open to the general public? Uh, 
Um, right now, the tennis courts are open Monday through Sunday from 7 a.m. till 12 noon or 12.30. Um, that's for exclusively for tennis club membership um, to be able to play. From 12.30 on um, until 10 o'clock at night, the general public um, or when I say general public, that means um, people who have purchased a $30 um, annual membership from the town can go in. So it doesn't mean that the courts are wide open like they are at Cardinal Woods. It means that those people who've paid the ex or paid the $30 to the municipality and said, I don't want to be a member of the tennis club, but I do want to play at those courts. So they pay $30 per year to be able to play. Um, the only exclusion to that time frame is on Thursday evenings, um, which is when there's um, inter-club play. So the general public or the public with the memberships are not permitted at that time. So I, I just want council to understand when I say general public, it, it's it's not open like it is at Cardinal Woods. It is um, limited to those people who have taken a town of Mono um, $30 membership to those clubs. And that's strictly to help pay for um, the maintenance of those club, of those courts. Yeah, Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Kim, if I could, how many uh, of those $30 uh, memberships, quote unquote, uh, are there? I believe we have about four at this time for this year. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, with uh, Mark's suggestion of that we go ahead and um, make a decision on the agreement and then allow staff to negotiate further with interest rates, but we would have to give direction as to what we would be uh, willing to accept. So if I could have, yes, Sharon? You, your mic? Uh, that sounds agreeable to me, yes. Okay, so uh, what would you be willing to allow staff to negotiate up to? Oh, I think that is something I want staff to be able to handle. <laughs> For me. Okay, uh, Fred? Well, okay, I'll, I'll bend a bit and if we have to go lower than prime plus a, a half, no lower than prime. Okay. John? I'd say no lower than prime. Okay. Ralph? I'm okay with that, but I think we need to have something, uh, some time frame built in differently, different than a, a fixed rate at Torah for 15 years. You've heard my, my suggestions and Mark's suggestions on I feel that's uh, that's what you'd get if you went anywhere else. So you, you can't get a 15 rate, 15 year fixed rate, particularly if something as as favorable as this. So whether it's okay. a renegotiated every year, or based on prime, or just floating based on prime, or we look at it again in five years' time and renegotiate it, something like that. I don't want to be holding the residents and the, uh, the council members uh, to an agreement uh, that turns out to be really bad uh, 10 years from now. Okay. So I think, Mark, that you've got a sense of what uh, the flavor of, of negotiations could be? Yeah, that's You're... fine. Thank you. Okay. So we do have a motion that we introduce and give the necessary readings to a bylaw authorizing the Town of Mono to enter into an agreement with the Mono Tennis Club substantially in the form as attached as Schedule A to bylaw for the construction of new tennis courts at Mono Center Park and that it be signed by the mayor and the clerk for the town of Mono, sealed and grossed in the bylaw book. Could I have a mover? Moved by Martin, second by Nix. And any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Is anyone opposed? Okay, so that's carried.
Your Worship, we're going in camera in five minutes. Can we have a five minute break? I was just about to say that we have to go in camera. Um, it is very time sensitive that we allow the presentation to take place as there's a, a commitment on the, the consultant's part. So if we take a five minute recess, we reconvene, go in camera for 11 o'clock.
closed meeting pursuant to section 239 of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended at 11.01 a.m. for a matter of advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege water system operator consultants report 2392F. And so if I could have a mover moved by Nix and seconded by Creelman and we're all in favor. So now that's carried. So Andrew, if you could take us offline, please.
Thank you, and I'm going to take my leave. Okay, thanks. Take care. Thanks, Chuck. back online. Okay, thank you, Andrew. So we have a motion that we rise from in-camera session at 12.10 p.m. and that the council accept the advice from the town solicitor and direct staff and the town solicitor to proceed accordingly. Could I have a mover? Moved by Martin and seconded by Mangtelo. Any discussion? Okay, so that's carried. And we will resume the agenda. We are down to under new business number five, the fleet electric vehicles and the motion that's been provided by Councillor Nix. Fred? Yeah, and just just to explain something, I the motion's worded very carefully and for the benefit of the rest of council, I'm not really directing public works to do anything that they weren't already doing. The main purpose in putting that motion in on the agenda and in the books is to give our public uh, some heads up as to the direction we're moving in. Um, uh, Mike is perfectly happy to look at this Ford F-150. He needs to check to see if some of the specifications are going to be okay for the job it has to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Mark. Uh, in the interim, uh, just so Council is aware, um, I have already uh, paid the $100 deposit for the uh, F-150 if that was the way council was going to move. So that was done about six to eight weeks ago. Okay. Good. The, the county's also put a deposit on the Ford F-150. So that's, that's good, Mark. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So um, we have a mo Yes, Ralph? Um, I, I'm very much in favor of this. Um, I'm just maybe mark can give us some advice but i'm just not too sure right about the wording here um and uh, i'm looking at the uh, res resolution that public works make plans to purchase an electric pickup as soon as they are available or become available I'm not quite sure why that's there because you really don't want to pick up the first one that becomes available likely the first one's going to be a rivet river and river and and uh f-150 is probably second Silverado is shortly behind. We're not too sure where Tesla is. So, Fred, were you really suggesting that we should, the first one that became available, that we should recommend that? What, we, we are going to be way, way down. The, the problem is we have to replace a pickup truck, two pickup trucks. Uh, is it next year, Mike? I, 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 I actually, Ralph, that wording I worked out with Mike, okay? That's the way he wanted it worded. Uh, he's going to do the investigations into the specs. We're in the waiting list. It certainly won't be the first uh, F-150 that comes off the, the line that we'll get. We're, we'll be way down the list. I think the question is going to be, they're, they're not coming to market till 2022 anyway. Um, will they be available in time for Mike to replace the pickup truck he has to replace? Well, that's that's, that's, a, that's a, a, an important um, process point of, of course the uh, rivian will be available uh whether it's going to be available in canada or not it'll be available this fall so your your uh, motion sort of suggests that he should be uh selecting that one you're saying the first one available so that's that's my only point for it i don't i wouldn't want to tie the tie him to that i i think that you know this is something that we need to get get into but it's going to have its hiccups you know I, i'm the only guy on this staff or the um Council who has an all electric vehicle and um, it's just had its second recoil, a re <laughs> recall, maybe a recoil too. <laughs> and so these these things are, I think they are the thing of the future, but they're they're not without uh, without problems. And I'm sure that Mike will want to look into it very much and he wouldn't want to be tied to having to go with the Rivian. And for, for the record, Ralph, I own a plug in hybrid, which is partly electric. Most of its driving is electric. And I had to take it into the shop last week because part of the undercarriage dropped off the car. <laughs> it's, only two, it's only two years old. Yeah. Okay. Madam, Madam Mayor, through the council, would, would a friendly amendment be to for me to budget for one in 2022? 
Sounds good to I me. Think budget for it, if we can get it, yeah. I'll budget for a pickup, and then if they're not, if they're not hitting the market or or yeah. available, then because the one the one will probably have to be replaced January first. <laughs> Put fifty eight thousand or sixty thousand in the budget for next year for a pickup truck. And then you, we can we can we can work through that process for sure. Okay, so what is the adjustment that we're making to the final paragraph on the motion? At Public Works uh, budget uh, in 2022 uh, for the purchase of an electric pickup truck, period. Just remove the as they become uh, as soon as they become available. I think that's the, to, to my thinking, that's the uh, one uh, phrase that I think would be nice to have out of there. Okay. Um, and in terms of the balance uh, from that being removed and making plans may involve some adjustments. Is that continued on? I think I think that that was Fred's um, and, and Mike's uh, way of sort of saying what I'm saying. They can uh, look into what's available and uh, and make the best selection. So I just leave that there. Okay, so Fred Simpson, have you been able to follow along with that? Yeah, what I've got then is uh, be it resolved the public works makes plans to budget in 2022 for the electric pickup truck, period. And then it carries on with uh, making okay. plans evolve. Does that sound reasonable? Sounds good. And, and by the way, there is a staff member that has a fully electric vehicle, but that's another issue. Oh, I didn't know. Who's that? <laughs> is that a secret? <laughs> Are they having better success? So I went in for my six month checkup and they told me to go away. There's no need. That was in case it was a hybrid. <laughs> well, they called me at GM to, for an oil change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they don't have maintenance schedules for EVs yet. They're, they're just, the dealerships just aren't there. The manufacturer might be, the dealers aren't prepared. Okay, and so we've got uh, Nix is moving that. Um, Mantelo, would you like to second the motion? Okay, and so that being said, is there any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Is anyone opposed? Okay, so that's carried. And then item six, the NEC development permit, 487-233 30th Side Road. And um, this, we have to make a decision as to how we are going to comment back. We have options. One is to um, arrange a public meeting in order to allow our residents an opportunity to provide comments um or we can support or conditionally support the nec permit which direction do you want to go mark your worship um this just came in i, th I believe wednesday thursday night um it's um we've done it before in the past uh tai chi was probably the last one that we did on a major application or a controversial application where we've advertised uh, provided the neighboring residents with with a copy of the NEC application and advised of a public meeting of council so that their concerns can be uh, considered as part of council's comments back to the NEC. Uh, if you recall, the NEC process is uh, uh, they just put a little posting up on the property, uh, circulate it to agencies, make a decision, and then the residents get notified of the decision. So it's uh, I've spent 30 years trying to get the NEC to change their um, their their uh, policies for public uh, circulation. So, hasn't uh, it's fallen on deaf ears. Um, so I think the the appropriate way to proceed would would be for us to set up a public meeting so that the public is aware of this uh, uh, controversial application, 
and uh, council can comment um, uh, following that meeting. The, the application does indicate uh, we need to let the NEC know we're gonna be late. They've never ever jumped the gun and made a decision without our comments being available. They want the, the uh, local municipality involved in, and providing them with comments. So uh, I wouldn't be concerned about the, the date that they put on their application as long as we, we advise them accordingly of our process. Okay, so if everyone is understanding that, yes, John? Uh, I just support what Mark is saying. Uh, I think it's a, it, it's imperative we let them know that uh, September 15th is, is too soon for us to uh, engage the public. Uh, there is a lot of interest in this. Uh, the NEC has informed me that no one objectors uh, are circulated uh, as well as uh, posting the, the little uh, uh, postage stamp uh, notice on the uh, on the property. I, I find it, in, and, I'll, and I'll just say this, I find it interesting that the application uh, describes uh, this as a recognition of an as-built development uh, and use of a paintball field. And this is an, yet another example of a use that has gone ahead uh, without approval and is now seeking dispensation uh, from the authority here, which happens to be the NEC. Uh, I'd like to see a, a very succinct uh, report from our planner uh, for the public meeting uh, that addresses a couple of issues. Number one, would this use be, uh, con uh, would this use be um, allowed anywhere else in Mono? Um, and what, what are the examples of paintball uh, operations in other municipalities, whether they are allowed next to uh, uh, residential or rural uses or whether they are confined to uh, uh, other uh, other zoning. Um, the other thing that is very unclear to me is that, uh, again, the, the application is very sparse, and it talks about uh, the the purpose being to host regular paintball training events for personal use only, not open to the general public and a construction of a viewing platform, which I do not believe is there. And then the installation of 20 hydro poles to support safety mesh during play. Uh, there are already hydro poles there. So are they saying they need another 20 or are they including the as built um, aspect of this? Because this is up and running. It's happening every weekend sometimes twice on a, on a weekend. Uh, and while they say it's not commercial, it is certainly organized and it is attracting a lot of opposition from the neighbors. Uh, I've been up there uh, two or three times and uh, when they are in full flight, uh, firing off uh, the devices, it is intrusive. It is very intrusive, notwithstanding the, the argument that it is somehow set back in a you know, back 40 kind of situation, the neighbors are very aware of what's going on there. So I, I'm in favor of a public meeting. I'm in favor of, of uh, asking the NEC for a day, and I'm in favor of getting some kind of guidance from our planner. Okay, so um, the motion that council directs staff to arrange a public meeting in order to afford residents an opportunity to provide comments to council on NEC permit application DR 2021-2022 slash 243 by Mary Beth and Ken Hinnon and Greg Hinnon, sorry. Uh, so did you want uh, to put that motion on the floor with the other items that you listed, John? Uh, all of that was by way of commentary. I think the important thing is that we schedule the public, we schedule the, the public meeting, and we ask for a delay from the NEC so that we can afford our residents the opportunity to uh, to address us. Okay.
And could I have someone second this, Sharon? And so if there are any other comments, Ralph? Ralph, you're muted. Sorry, thank you. John brought up a question which I also had uh, addressed to me from another member of our community. And that is, do we have a, an approach to um, developments which are proceeded with without a permit? Does the town have a, shall we say, uh, an understanding of how they're gonna uh, deal with things? Uh, um, at the moment, it doesn't appear to be, it's, it's, it appears to others, and I think usually to myself, that we just say, no, you have to back off, you can't do it, or yes, you can carry on and do it. Um, I'm wondering if we shouldn't have something that was um, um, more prescriptive and um, a bit hard-nosed. Mark? Well, there's several layers there, Councillor Manktelo. Um, and just on this one, this is the NEC. Uh, and they're the enforcement agency. Um, I think from the town's perspective, when we're aware, when, when we become aware of a situation, we do investigate it. Our first step is normally to advise the applicant that they're doing something illegal. And if they wanna continue doing it, they need to make application and get approval. What we've seen in the past in a couple of situations is after we've advised the landowner of that, that they continue on doing uh, the the illegal use and I think that is then a policy direction from council that we could investigate as to whether council says if it continues then we're not you know do not process an application um, and I think that's 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 a fair fair way to go about it I, I don't know what other municipalities do um, but we can certainly look into that and, and bring a policy back but we certainly don't condone, you know, uses to continue when once we've determined that they're illegal. And and we are investigating. I think as council is aware, we do have other situations. You don't want to be in court where where you're, you know, you've charged someone and they're sitting there waiting for their application to be heard by council. I think it would be good to have a, a policy, uh, Mark. I, I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, the the. Uh, there's a sense, I think, with some people that they'll just start something and if they get away with it, fine. If they get stopped, then they have to um, uh, 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 put in an application or whatever, ask for a permit. Um, and that they haven't lost anything. They've gone ahead and may have, and then may actually win by being doing something that nobody, nobody even knows they've done it. So it'd be nice to have a policy and have something that would be uh, on our website that might um, be a bit of a deterrent. I know the, um, I mean, the county's deterrent there is if, if you get caught building uh, without a permit and you should have had a permit, they double the fees, right? So that's that's another penalty there, so. Yes, I know one situation in other municipalities, this was quite a few years ago, where they uh, went ahead without a, a, a permit and uh, it was a, a residential building and they were made to tear it down, right down to the ground. Mm -hmm. I, I, I actually I actually asked the NEC about uh, um, the fact that the activity is still ongoing or is ongoing and how that impacts an application and their response was they didn't have the authority to stop the activity however they had the authority if the uh, permit application is is refused to order that the property be restored. Okay, so that's their only authority. That's their only authority, but they don't have the authority to say, while well, this application is pending, you will cease the activity. Okay, so <clears throat> we have the motion on the floor, moved by Creelman, seconded by Martin. Any further discussion? Okay, call for the vote. Anyone? Oh, sorry, Dave. Just to add, I mean, this did come up earlier at another council meeting. There is a bulletin, but it is pretty sparse. And I think I did pass it on to council and it outlines uh, generally where the NEC would apply a clearance letter versus the need for DP or their 
NEC development permit approval pro, uh, application process. Um, recreation, I think, is one that falls in the middle somewhere. Um, this is in the rural designation. Um, so anyway, we will have the meeting, of course. I will prepare a report, and it will provide a fulsome review of, um, you know, the circumstances at hand as well as NEC policy. So that's a bit more information for you. Okay, thank you. So uh, is anyone opposed to the motion? Seeing none, carried. So on to Schedule A. Ralph, do you have anything on Schedule A? Uh, yes, I do, Your Honor. Um, it's number five. And um, just pulling it up here. It's a, sorry, it's not number five either. Um, it's the number four, the Headwaters Healthcare Foundation. I have you know, just briefly corresponded with Kim on this. Um, uh, this is a challenge. It's hard to know from the what the the presentation that we've got uh, how this would play out or how, what the possibilities were for people to take part, etc. However, I do think that it's something that Mona should um, uh, consider taking part in, and it may be that this can be done with very little input uh, from our staff uh, all through the website, of course. Um, what I'd, I'd like to propose, I'm not sure whether we need a proposal or just give it to Kim direction to investigate this further with a view to coming up with a, um, a, a, a suggestion to uh, council about whether Mona would be involved. Okay, um, so because it starts in September, uh, it would have to be a quick turnaround for us, right? Kim's pretty sad. Yeah. So, yes, Fred? Uh, I have had discussions with uh, Kendra Goss at Headwaters on this, um, and they have sent uh, some further information over. Uh, of course, Orangeville and Caledon have gone on board, and uh, Headwaters has a website to promote this uh, activity, this event, where they would set up a dedicated fundraising page for the municipality under the banner of the mayor, that uh, the mayor is sort of the team captain. But all it really involves is individuals going to this website and when they wish to make a donation, they don't actually have to do anything to make the donation. So they're not asking people to go out and solicit um, uh, sponsors. You just go out and you go to their website, whether you've gone for a walk, hike, or ride or not. Go to their website, and when you make a donation, you can select a team that your donation is then applied to. So. Um, in the case of Mona residents, you would select the town of Mono or the mayor's team, um, and the donations would be attributed to that team. And that's the extent of this uh, this program. Thanks, Fred. That makes it even simpler. I think I'd, I'd be in favor of us getting our name name down there. Okay. Is everybody in agreement? All right. So, Fred, you'll help us out there. Absolutely. All right. Is there anything else, Ralph, on a, on Schedule A? That, that's all, Your Honor. Okay. Fred Nix, did you have anything? No? Just Sharon Martin? Four. Okay. John? Did you have anything on Schedule A? Just to say the POA disbursements look very promising. Well, yeah. Okay, so if there's nothing further, uh, we have a motion that we accept Schedule A to this agenda. Could I have a mover? Moved by Nick, seconded by Manklo. And anyone opposed? That's carried. Okay, so reports of council and staff projects. And uh, start with, uh, I guess, Dave Trotman. Thank you, Mayor Ryan. Um, just a few things. Um, field date for the hotel minor variance, that was for the fourth floor of the hotel. 
uh, will expire um, the 25th. So two days from now, we haven't heard anything at this point. Um, so just an FYI to council on that. Um, and also I think as council is aware, the, uh, the second variance regarding parking was resolved before it came to the first meeting. Um, we have a few pre-consults on the table coming up um, for lands uh, on Highway 10, um, another one by 10 and side with 30. Uh, I've got to review those to see where we're going to take those as part of circulation. Again, a bit of an FYI for council. Um, the uh, the one application that went before planning committee was the uh, proposed wedding venue at uh, 207535 Highway 9 at uh, fourth line. Um, so that went August 19th. There was some lively and fulsome discussion on that application. Um, we actually uh, did a good circulation under the act requirements in any the, any event. So there was a few people who did comment. Um, we also got a comment from a landowner over on the Caledon side, all provided interesting comments to committee. And um, uh, this will be coming forward to most likely the September, uh, excuse me, September 28th council meeting as a, a staff public meeting uh, for review by council. Uh, so committee's decision, committee's recommendation it was to deny it. Um, other than that, uh, we do have some CO, uh, committee of adjustment applications coming forward as well. And uh, I did get a call from Mr. Black on the Bluebird storage. Things are going so well there. He is thinking of putting on, which was earmarked and shown as part of the first phase, a second phase, a smaller second phase that would be through amendment to the existing site plan agreement. So I haven't seen that submission yet, um, but I expect it shortly. Um, and I think that's about what I have for now for council. Um, that's it. Any questions of Dave? Yes, John. Uh, Dave, where are we with the response to the county's uh, request for uh, comment on the uh, natural heritage strategy? So I've got those comments. Um, they have been reviewed through the chair of the steering committee, and I'm trying to finalize the comments back for them shortly. I'll probably okay, have it done. Thank you. Not forgotten. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, David. And on to Kim. Um, I do have a few things for council to bring up to date on. Um, the first is um, to let you know we had our pre-construction meeting last week. Um, regarding the Island Lake Family Park and um, please to let you know that um, it's scheduled to start this week which is great notices went out to the residents they were hand delivered to all residents who back onto the property um, as well as um, a couple across the street on first line 28 residents in total um, received a hand delivered letter and um, the remaining residents in both Island Lake and Fieldstone are receiving their letters via um, Canada Post. So um, everyone up there has been notified. To this point, um, or I, actually one thing I would like to say just um, is that I was speaking with our staff member yesterday who hand delivered the notices. And um, unfortunately she was um, greeted with some verbal inappropriateness from some of the residents um, when she delivered the notice so um, that was that was a little concerning to me that um, that she she had to um, deal with that but um, she's very good in public relations and uh, she dealt with it with the utmost of confidence but she did share it with me so I wanted to share that with council as well um, to this point, I have received um, three um, emails slash phone calls from residents who received their letters, um, which have been forwarded to council to to let you know about that. And um, you know, some one resident is concerned about the the uh, time that the uh, construction will be set for. We've set it from 
7 a.m. to possibly 7 p.m. The contractor said he wouldn't go into like as late as 7 p.m. unless absolutely necessary, but um, he does need to go Monday through Saturdays because of the um, incredible tight time frame of this project. We're so late in getting it started because of the um, approval process that was delayed and um, we, we really are at the mercy of Mother Nature right now to get these um, courts put in and a good quality project, a good quality court put in. Um, so we are, we do have to, you know, we do have to look at the possibility of working Saturdays and working till 7 p.m. at night, but the contractor very much is mindful of the residents and has um, assured me he will do everything to his utmost to um, try and stay within the Monday to Friday time frame and to 5 p.m. but um, there is the possibility he will ex he will go beyond that time frame. Um, the other thing is, um, and I feel it necessary to let, you know, talk to council about um, if there's any of the concerns that have been sent to you that you, you know, you feel that need to be spoken about that we should, we should discuss them. But um, otherwise I can certainly respond to um, the one resident who um, is concerned about um, things like um, putting landscaping up uh, along her property line, which runs parallel to the um, parking lot. Um, also concerned about not being able to have access to the trail system at the Island Lake Conservation Area while the construction is going on. Um, she is um, also concerned about whether or not the courts will be um, available strictly to neighboring residents um, or will the courts be open up to all residents or you know general public so um, I, I wanted to bring that forward to make sure that council had received that has looked at it and whether or not you have any comments regarding any of those concerns that have been brought forward um, I also received another email from another resident um, backing on and other than hoping that she will get some plantings behind her home. Um, she's very excited about the project, um, thinks it'll be a great addition to the community and um, wants to be assured that she's still going to have access to the trail system at Island Lake Conservation Area once the project is done because she and her family use it on a regular basis. So sharing that with you as well. Um, other than that, um, changing projects here have been um, working with um, getting quotes for the stamped engineering drawings that we have to have for the Menorah Park outdoor washroom project. And um, it, it's amazing what it costs to have a stamped engineer drawing to put in a toilet and a sink and a storage building. I am pretty much blown away by what those charges are. And so um, because of the um, first quote that came in, I'm now forced to go. And because of our procurement bylaw, I will be getting other quotes um, before proceeding with this. So I'm just letting council know that um, it is holding up the project a wee bit, but um, I guess because it is a, um, washroom that is going to be open to the public. We have to follow these protocols and we do have to have stamped engineered drawings in order to put a toilet and a sink in a bathroom. So um, working away at that. Other than that, um, I think I think that's about it. I've got um, lots on the, on my plate. Our, our final soccer program, our final night of soccer is tomorrow night. Unfortunately, I've gone ahead and had to cancel it because of the um, incredible temperatures that are scheduled for tomorrow evening. So we do have soccer giveaways that uh, we'll be giving out to every player and um, our uh, recreation assistant, Emma, our summer recreation assistant, she's done a great job in putting this together and Dairy Queen has once again sponsored us. and. Um, so yeah, we've got a great little surprise for all of the players tomorrow that they'll be able to pick up, but um, the heat, we just can't let the kids play in 37 degree temperatures tomorrow evening.
Thank you. Any questions of Kim? Yes, John? Uh, uh, Kim, in no particular order, um, I take it the uh, parking lot is now closed off at Island Lake? That, that's correct. It was supposed to start yesterday, so um, I'm heading up there um, right after this, this meeting, and then I'm heading over to Menorah Park to meet another um, um, engineering company for hopefully another quote for the bathrooms yeah okay so uh, i hope mike is mike is listening but i think it's imperative that we get our signage up on the first line uh and and uh, i say that because people are not going to be uh dissuaded from uh, trying to enter uh the uh, cbc lands they'll simply park on the first line of line um, I believe, sorry, I believe the signage went up this morning. I did receive oh. um, an email from one of my staff asking me if, you want, if we wanted on the front gate or back further into the park, and I told him front gate. So um, I'm going to go oh, up. I'm we, we, the no, par no parking signage on the first line. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I haven't done anything in different regards signage. to that. Different yeah. signage. No, I, too I much think, signage. Too much, exactly. I agree. <laughs> So I'll leave that with Mike, but I think I think it's imperative we get the the no parking signage up on the first line uh, to um, uh, counteract the fact that the uh, parking lot is now closed. Okay. Any anybody else have questions for Kim? I, I, I have I have two more. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, sorry. I received I received a number of uh, of comments about flattening uh, the field. Uh, and uh, I, I take responsibility because uh, I raised the question of whether or not it made sense to do this at the time that we were doing everything else. And uh, unfortunately, a number of people uh, became, uh, uh, shall we say, accustomed to the idea that this was not, on, not in the scope of the project because of the cost overruns. And then suddenly we decide that, that we could afford to do it. Uh, so I just want to put on record the fact that there is opposition to flattening uh, the field. Uh, the concern is that it will attract organized um, soccer and, and other activities and that we don't have the parking, frankly, uh, to accommodate that. So uh, I don't know how others feel about that, but I just, I just want to say that on behalf of the people who've contacted me, uh, that is a concern. Ralph? Um, I, uh, I read the, uh, those emails and I thought I should check this out. So I, I did uh, visit the park uh, yesterday and uh, some of the uh, comments were things like you could play soccer and fly a kite there with no problem. But you can fly a kite there, but to play any game like soccer or football or baseball or even frisbee, uh, you you really could not because it's not level. Uh, not only is it not level, but it's it's, it's not flat. It's irregular. Now you, you can overlook the irregularity a little bit, but I actually walked and ran on it, and and it 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 does need to be flat. And this is uh, so the people who have said that uh, it's uh, quite uh, adequate right now, I, I I think that I differ from that that opinion. Um, I also went to the Mona Amaranth School for comparison and looked at their four soccer fields. And um, they, uh, they're perfectly flat. They're not uh, perfectly level, I should say. They're, they're not perfectly flat, but they're much flatter than, uh, significantly flatter than, than the fields are at Island Lake. So I think that, um, uh, that we should go, definitely should go ahead with the original plan that we put in uh, playing fields there. The uh, statement that uh, this is going to attract other teams, I don't think is, is uh, valid because we control who, who um, uses that, uh, uses the fields. And um, so that I don't think, John, that there's a there's a potential uh, problem there uh, with respect to, to parking. So I would be, I'd be quite in favor of going going ahead with this. And there is a, a great place for this, uh, and it's it's to the far, mostly to the west and uh, north of the um, um, the, w the western side of the field and north of the uh, playground equipment. Okay. And, 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 and that, that's fair. I, I committed to raising the issue. Um, the, third, uh, the third issue, 
I, I think has to do with the hours of construction. I was a little surprised to see uh, Monday through Saturday and the, uh, the hours. Uh, all I'd say to Kim is use your negotiation skills to keep it down to a dull roar. <laughs> okay. And, you know, we've got a good relationship with the contractor. They do a lot of work for us. Uh, they're good people, but I think we need to try and talk to them. I mean, you know, time may not be of the essence to us. All right. I know we have tight time frames and so forth, but the reality is that uh, we also have neighbors who are going to be affected by this. Um, if we took out, if we took out the um, flattening of the playing field, that might be helpful. Uh, but if that's not going to happen, let's uh, try and negotiate with the contractor to uh, stay within uh, normal hours uh, of operation. Okay. Anything else for Kim? Yes, Fred? Well, I, I know this is difficult, and I hear John's point about flattening the field and whether or not we should do it, but I, I would support what Ralph said. I think we've got the machinery in there. It was in the original plan. I think we should go ahead with it now. Yes, Sharon? Um, I, I agree as well. And it is important to know that nobody's going to be setting up soccer things without Kim knowing about it. That's not, that's just not on. Nobody gets a field without uh, permission from town and they're paying for it. So, and we can just say it doesn't happen up there. That's all. Okay, so thank you then, Kim. Uh, Les, do you have anything for us? Uh, no, I have nothing further to report, Madam Mayor. Thank okay. you. Any questions for Les? Seeing none. Mike, is there anything further from you? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. So the fiber agreement from uh, that we're finalizing with North Frontenac, and that should come to council next meeting. Uh, Matt and I are finishing 16 permits for fiber install. And I sent those maps out to council a couple of weeks ago, so so the, we'll start to see some holes around our intersections and in front of properties in the coming weeks. Uh, Bridge 10, uh, second line in Hockley, it opened on Friday, and uh, Bridge 11 closed subsequently the following Monday. So uh, now we're over to first line in Hockley, and. Uh, and came in at a decent budget on bridge 10 so it's working out well crack sealing and line painting we want to get the cracks sealed before we line paint so that's going to be happening on third line north of the landfill and then five side road east of uh, uh east of the ag center i believe is where we're working on our crack sealing uh extremely happy with our limestone application um one problem i see coming is right around i'm going to make everybody cold right now i hope um right around november 1st we're going to start to open these roads we're going to the ones that are packed in like pavement right now we got to open them up because we got to get that stone loose before it freezes for winter and that's uh that's mandatory on these gravel roads so there will our expectation is there will be questions as to why um, but we're setting November 1st as our no nonsense turnaround date because it takes about uh, uh, two to two weeks to get around the entire town. So some of them are going to hold all the way till November and we're, we haven't graded this summer hardly at all. So we're, uh, we're extremely happy. Uh, we got a few potholes and a little bit of washboard, but other than that, it's good. Um, on the cold salt dome is going to get filled for winter and we'll be releasing our seasonal ad for our seasonal help uh, coming up in the uh, i actually i think it was released today for our seasonal help um september 9th is the deadline for the icip green intake grant it's focused on health and safety of water systems um, we're, we're, we're working with the arsenic removals in uh, the island lake wells um, that's our that's our key. The MECP's asking what we're doing, and and we're we're looking to uh, 
uh, to apply for some money on that. Uh, and, and we're not, I'm still having meetings. We're not sure what that looks like, whether it looks like a, an EA for a new well or, uh, or new wells in plural or whether we're looking at uh, remove arsenic removal. So we're going through all this right now and uh, that'll be what I'm working on for the next couple of weeks. Other than that, uh, council, if you have any more questions, uh, I'm good. Any questions of Mike? Yes, John? Uh, Mike, thank you for the update on the North Frontenac uh, project. Um, I've had some contact with the uh, North Frontenac and uh, they are absolutely delightful to deal with. Um, they are excited. They are enthusiastic about extending into Mono. Um, I suggested to them that we could hold uh, a public meeting at some point uh, where their representatives could uh, explain, you know, what, what services they are providing. Uh, and um, we, uh, we agreed that that would probably be a good thing they're heavily advertising in the local press as to their uh, their uh, rollout, and uh, I couldn't be happier about it, frankly. So that's great, and we one part of our permit process, John, was uh, residential notification. I, I I was trying to envision their business plan of how they uh, how they run fiber by your property, but don't necessarily tell you they're doing it. So. So their, their goal is to launch a campaign as part of the permit process, um, which will twofold uh, be a, uh, a sort of a sales uh, a sales letter. So so once I get copy of that letter and we approve it for the residential consumption, um, I'll definitely add it to the agenda. Hopefully we can have it by next week. And, and, and uh, part of that letter to everyone in, in uh uh, vicinity of their uh, rollout um, should be or could be a uh, an opportunity to join us online to talk about it. Um, they're very open to this. Oh, okay. Um, le let me work through that process with you, John. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Ralph. Mike, uh, just a quick question. What happens if you don't break up the limestone? A uh, little bit like salt or water rolling on your smooth countertop when when it freezes. Because um, remember, we can't uh, we can't add salt to gravel in the winter, and uh, so we need that we need that under under layer to have some gravelly surface texture to it. So. Um, it would uh, be li like running your fingernails across, uh, uh, not a chalkboard, because um, that makes noise, but fingernails along marble top, they just wouldn't dig in. And, uh, and that's what our ice blades would do is they would just, uh, so we need to get that, we need to let it freeze in its uh, grand, sort of, sort of when it's ruffled up a bit. Um, because if it freezes with that smooth top on it, we'll be, uh, We'll, we'll have a lot of trouble getting the ice blades into the uh, into the ice. So just create, it's it, it doesn't. We want that level of gravel in between the ice and the snow. So helps for traction, right? Okay. All right. Thanks, Mike. Fred Simpson. Uh, so just one item for uh, council, if you recall, council directed that. Uh, establish a working group for uh, putting together a uh, information package about buying property in Mono. And uh, council said that uh, they're interested in getting some representation from the real estate industry. So I'm just looking for some, uh, some feedback from council, uh, whether uh, council is going to pursue that if they'd like staff to reach out to say the Ontario Real Estate Association um as opposed to directly to a local uh realtor and gauge any interest they might have in sitting on this committee any thoughts john uh my intent in that motion was that we go with uh, somebody local who is well established and visible or or you know I can think of a few names. Um, 
who I think would be very keen to do it. So Fred, I can, I, I'll get in contact with you about it, and give you a few names. Me too. Okay. So is it council's intent and so council just wants to appoint someone or just not sure what the process is going to be here. Um, we're going to put some names forward for nomination or just appoint someone. Well, there's a mo there's a motion to do it. So I think that if we, we come up with somebody who's, uh, you know, active in, in Mono, uh, and is well respected and, um, willing to do it. I'd like to seek uh, council's dispensation to uh, to have that person join the committee. Okay. I've seen no objections and I guess that's the direction. Okay. Thank you. Any questions of Fred? Okay. Thanks, Fred. Mark. Uh, very quickly. I attended the stakeholders group uh, for Dufferin County's transit feasibility study last week. Uh, it was an interesting meeting. Um, they're, uh, I guess that's a county project and they're looking at uh, uh, whether it's going to be feasible um, and useful to um, um, have a, a public transit, mass transit, or I guess it'd be public transit through uh, Dufferin County. So. I believe that was kind of the first step in their process and uh, we'll see what comes out of that. Um, I think as you're aware, I've met with the two objectors with the uh, full throttle application. The mediation is uh, next, uh, the 31st next Tuesday. And uh, we've got a development team meeting tomorrow and a parks committee meeting on Thursday. So that's basically all I have. Okay. Any questions of Mark? Okay. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so uh, Ralph, do you have anything to report? Uh, I just have a request, Your Honor. Um, I, I'd like to hear from Eugene about the progress with uh, any of the areas that he has under management. I'm thinking particularly of the fourth line south. I'm wondering if we could have Eugene report to Mark at possibly our next meeting. Okay, and Sharon? Um, uh, the mono pollinator garden in the spring will be adding another bench and another tree and it's in memoriam for someone that you may know um, Craig Wilson and we're very happy to do that he he did a lot of things uh, in mono and had to move because it wasn't uh, the right place for his wife to be but he has fond memories of that and I think that's wonderful that the family is very keen on doing this. Um, and on Thursday, still back at the Mono Pollinator Garden, butterflies were let um, were released. And this is a program that um, comes from Hospice Dufferin. And uh, there, it, I think it's going to be in the paper and maybe on Rogers, which doesn't help us much out here but um, I think it's probably going to be reported on, which will give us a little bit more um, status maybe. And uh, also it's, it's a possibility that it will be an annual event. So if other people would like to do this, I imagine that they could contact, um, contact Hospice Dufferin and find out when the next release will be. Thank you. Okay, Fred. So I, I have no town business, but I, I'll pass on an interesting observation. As you know, I'm a Bruce Trail member. Last year in the section that Frank and I look after, we took down about 50 dead ash trees. Two weeks ago, we had a volunteer do an inventory. This is between the third line and the fourth line. And there's a main trail and a side trail there. We have 119 more dead ash trees to deal with this winter, 119. If I, could comment, if I could comment on the ash trees, sitting on my dock, I'm hearing the branches fall. Okay, not full trees, but the branches drop from the top. It's really scary. And that, that's why ash trees in particular are, are so dangerous. They do that. 
not only are they dangerous for hikers, but sometimes when you're cutting them down, <laughs> you've got to be very careful. We wear hard hats because you can have the top of the tree snap back at you. Okay, John, do you have anything to report? I don't. Thank you. Okay, okay. so I'm attending the uh, Ram Rodeo this Saturday. It's at the fairgrounds, so it's nice to see that back again. And uh, so if there's nothing further, do we have any notices of motion? Have you informed Mark Derp and Darby? <laughs> Who knows? <clears throat> Um, so, if there's nothing further, we can close off that we introduce and give the necessary readings to a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of Council of Town of Mono, Session 17-2021, held on the 24th of August 2021, that it be signed by the Mayor and the Clerk and sealed and engrossed in the bylaw mm -hmm. book. Could I have a mover? Moved by Martin and seconded by <laughs> Nix. And anyone opposed? That's carried. And that we adjourn this meeting at 1.05 p.m. Not a bad track record for us. Could I have a mover? Moved by Nix and seconded by Manktelo. Okay, so that's carried. Thank you, everybody, and try and stay cool. Bye-bye.